Good evening and welcome to the council meeting for Monday, December the 12th, 2022. I would ask now that we all rise for the playing of the national anthem followed by a moment of reflection. Please be seated. I will now look to Councillor Phillips to read the land acknowledgement. Excuse me. The land on which Council meets today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, acknowledging this as a reminder that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. Thank you, Councillor Phillips. And just so that the rest of Council feels good, I did get my Christmas sweater delivered to me so that I could join in in the festive fun. Um, welcome to all of those who are here for our final council meeting for the 2022 calendar year. Thank you for those of you joining us in chambers today and for those of you tuning in from home. Uh, we have a jam-packed agenda, as I'm sure we're all aware, so I will jump right into the mayor's report. I will begin with condolences this evening. On behalf of council and city staff, I'd like to extend condolences to the family and friends of Stanley Haywood. Stanley served in the Royal Canadian Navy from 1940 to 1944 before beginning his career with Ontario Hydro, eventually becoming the general manager of St. Catharines Hydroelectric Commission in 1971. During his distinguished career with St. Catharines Hydro, he was involved in many achievements, the pinnacle of which was the planning and construction of the Port Luzi Power Generating Station. In his honour, the station would eventually be named the Haywood Generating Station, and city flags are lowered today in memory of community leader Stanley Haywood. In addition, we would also like to extend our condolences to the family and friends of George Porky Douglas. Porky was well loved by the community, his coworkers at TRW, the many kids he coached in both hockey and Little League baseball, as well as his teammates from the Meriton Stingers, for whom he played goalie until the age of 62. We'd like to pass on our condolences to his family and friends. We do have a number of issues on the agenda uh, this evening. Uh, the first one is the 2023 operating budget, which will be tabled at tonight's meeting. Uh, I would like to remind the general public as you are looking through the budget, if you do have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to send those through to budget at Uh The budget will be debated uh, on January the 16th, with the 17th set aside for additional deliberations if necessary, although I believe we are all hopeful that we won't need a second evening of deliberations this year. Uh, at the beginning of December, I was pleased to attend my first OBCM, that's the Ontario Big City Mayor's Meeting. 
Uh, the Ontario Big City Mayors is a group designed to advocate on behalf of municipalities over 100,000 people in population regarding issues that are specific to them. Uh, we discuss issues related to homelessness and the opioid epidemic, both of which continue to affect other municipalities in the same way they are affecting us here in St. Catharines. And OBCM is continuing to push the provincial government to pause aspects of legislation such as Bill 23 and to ensure cities are made whole from the financial changes the province has put forward. And OBCM has received uh, or has gotten some traction with their messaging as we have seen the province make a commitment recently to make municipalities whole and ensure that any revenue losses created by the legislation will be filled by the provincial government. So that's good to see. Uh, at the start of December, Regional Council officially appointed Brian Height as a Regional Council representing St. Catharines to fill the vacant seat created with the appointment of Jim Bradley to chair as our council had recommended at the meeting previous. At the same meeting, councillors were appointed to various agencies, boards, and commissions, uh, as well as standing committees. And in addition to normal committee assignments, I will also be representing St. Catharines uh, at the Niagara Regional Housing Board, where I was selected as the vice chair. Uh, we are pleased to see that St. Catharines is well represented across all of the agencies, boards, and commissions, as well as the standing committees at the regional level. Congratulations, and I have a, a good list of congratulations. Uh, first of all, the Arts Award, uh, our Arts Awards at the end of November. I was pleased to attend the 2022 Arts Awards at the First Ontario Performing Arts Centre, along with uh, Councillors Garcia, Councillor McPherson, uh, Councillor Stevens. Did I miss anybody? I think I got everybody who was there that night. But uh, it was a wonderful time. Uh, we celebrated 20 nominees across five categories, including the Making a Difference Award, the Arts and Education Award, Emerging Artist, Established Artist, and a Jury's Pick Award, along with a special Patron of the Arts Award. So congratulations to the winners, Emily Oriold, Dr. Dr. Rachel Rensink-Hoff, Catherine Sinopoli, Amy Friend, Monica Dufo, and Frank Goldspink. And thank you to all the 2022 nominees for enriching our community with their talent and experiences. I think we all look forward to seeing what comes next. Uh, congratulations to Community Care on their 18th annual Great Holiday Food Drive. Um, earlier this month, uh, members of my staff attended a media event with different partners uh, included in the Feed Niagara group, as well as representatives from Feed Ontario. Um, the message that was shared at the time was the growing need for food assistance uh, at the same time as we are seeing donations dwindle. Um, there are a number of concerns going on within our community and communities like ours. Food bank usage is up over 40%, and so the food banks need the support from the community. Uh, on Friday, we here in St. Catharines and across Niagara had the opportunity to attend the Great Holiday Food Drive, which supported Community Care St. Catharines Thorold, as well as nine other food banks across Niagara uh, that make up Feed Niagara. Through the generosity of those in our community, donations of non-perishable food items, toys, and money surpassed $614,000. So thank you to everyone who supported the event, and thank you to the team at Community Care for organizing this important fundraiser here in our city. And I want to thank all of the city councillors who attended. Uh, and I will, as always, give a special thanks to Councillor Matt Harris, who dressed as an elf, uh, which may be part of the reason why he is at home sick today, uh, as he was out in the cold in an elf suit uh, and not much else. Uh, Last Wednesday, I had the opportunity to attend the Knox Presbyterian Church uh, Christmas concert. I want to thank Reverend Ken and all the folks over at Knox Presbyterian um, who held that concert as a benefit concert for the Out of the Cold program. Um, the work that Out of the Cold in, does in our community is invaluable. Uh, as, I, as I said last Wednesday evening, it breaks my heart to know that Out of the Cold is something we need here in St. Catharines. Uh, but it warms my soul to know that there are a number of people in our community working hard to make sure that the program is properly funded and that it exists for those who are in need in our community. On Friday, I was pleased to join former Mayor Walter Sensick, along with Steve Borisenko and other members of the Youth Substance Use Task Force at the launch of SaveMyLife.ca, a website meant to provide parents and youth with information about substance abuse and the resources available. The task force was created after Steve lost his 21-year-old son Jacob to a suspected fentanyl overdose in June of 2021. Following his son's death, uh, Mr. Borsenko said he sought resources but struggled to navigate the systems in place. With the support of Mayor Senzik and community organizations such as Community Addiction Services of Niagara or CASSEN, Pathstone Mental Health, Niagara Region Public Health, Niagara Health, uh, a plan was formed culminating in the launch of the Save My Life website. 
with the support of Moonbase, a multimedia creative company based in downtown St. Catharines. An ad campaign and website were created to appeal to both parents and youth to help them learn about the mental health and substance use resources that are available. So to Mr. Borisenko, to Mayor Senzik, and the various community partners, thank you for your leadership. I would encourage everybody who has uh, young people in their life to visit savemylife.ca. Uh, you're going to start seeing messaging throughout the city popping up in city facilities as well as other venues, uh, speaking in language that perhaps is more blunt than many of us are used to seeing, but it's important message. Uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to visit savemylife.ca. The resources there are very valuable uh, and they're resources that many in my community have said have been uh, hard to find in the past. SaveMyLife.ca does a good job of bringing all of those resources into one place to help parents who are struggling uh, and to help young people who are struggling uh, with addiction issues. And a few things to look forward to. First of all, free parking has returned to the downtown. The City of St. Catharines is offering free parking downtown on weekday afternoons this holiday season to help make shopping local and holiday get-togethers a little bit easier. Uh, it's now a holiday tradition, but the city's offering up to three hours of free parking between noon and 6 p.m. on weekdays from Monday, December 12th through to Friday, December 30th in the downtown core. The holiday parking promotion is in effect at city-owned on-street metered spots and city-owned parking lots with pay machines. Uh, the Ontario Street Garage is eligible for free parking from noon to 6 p.m. for up to three hours. And those parking at the garage who are visiting a downtown business can ask for a voucher from the business providing for three hours of free parking at the garage. So be sure to take advantage of the holiday season and shop, dine, and enjoy downtown St. Catharines. And I know we have a motion that will be coming later on this evening, uh, which may have some additions to it as well. Uh, but uh, as it says, take advantage of the free parking uh, and get out to support those local businesses. I'm excited to have the community join us tomorrow, December the 13th, for the 32nd annual Civic Christmas Carol Concert at St. Thomas Anglican Church, 99 Ontario Street. Uh, this is the first time the concert, or the community, sorry, has been able to come together in person for the concert since 2019, and admission is free, uh, but monetary donations will always be accepted on behalf of Community Care of St. Catharines and Thorold. The doors open at 11.30 a.m. with the concert beginning at noon, uh, and I do hope to see as many members of the community as possible there. Uh, just a reminder that registration for the city's winter aquatics and recreation programs opens online for all St. Catharines residents beginning at 6 p.m. Uh, and you can visit stcatharines.ca slash active STC to ensure your spot. In-person registration is going to open on December the 14th at 8.30 a.m. at the Kiwanis Aquatic Center. As the city where everybody can play, the city has a variety of activities that will be available to all ages and all abilities, including some new additions to the traditional favorites that participants enjoy. So be sure to, be sure to guarantee a spot in your favorite program by registering early. Two more. I'm almost there. A reminder that the Let It Glow, a celebration of light festival continues this Friday, December 16th in Port Dalhousie from 5 to 8 p.m. Join us as we parade from Lakeside Park to Rennie Park led by the Let It Glow dance production. Everyone will receive a glow stick and hot chocolate voucher for Captain's Cabin. And once at Rennie Park, make your way through an archway of light into the magical forest park with a 360 degree Santa photo op inside. Take selfies with all of the forest friends like deer, moose, beavers, and more. Don't miss a special performance from the Let It Glow dance production. And I look forward to seeing everybody out on Friday in beautiful Port Dalhousie. And finally, I am happy to announce that the New Year's Day levy is returning after a three-year absence. And I know members of the Hague neighborhood are even more excited to know that the guns will go off at early on New Year's Day. Uh, the annual tradition is co-hosted by the Lincoln and Welland Regiment and the 10th Battery RCA. Uh, the public is welcome to join myself and all those members of council who are up bright and early on New Year's Day on January 1st, 2023 at the Lake Street Armory at 81 Lake Street. Uh, we'll be going from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to ring in the new year, and I do hope to see you there. For those of us who have been in the past, uh, it is always an enjoyable experience. Um, I am always blessed to have the opportunity to stand next to Councillor Phillips, who is always in a wonderful mood at 11 a.m. on New Year's Day. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to go around the horn, because I like that. That was fun the last time we did it. Uh, are there any uh, announcements, short, brief announcements, that anybody in the horseshoe would like to make? Councillor Phillips. You mentioned about the, uh, the food drive, and I just wanted to mention that... Uh, 
when we had the uh, Grape and Wine Festival at the park, uh, patrons were able to uh, hand in former tokens that they had because we went with a cashless day. And uh, the Grape and Wine Festival um, accumulated all those tokens and made a donation of $5,000 towards community care uh, so that people know that those tokens actually went to uh, a great deal of good in the community. That's actually a wonderful story, and I'm glad to hear that. That's awesome. Any others? I shocked you at the last meeting by giving you this opportunity and now nobody knows what to say. I do appreciate, I will say, a couple of councillors reached out and offered things for the mayor's report. That offer is always there, but if councillors do want to be able to bring those uh, announcements or anything else, uh, feel free to do that during the mayor's report. With that, we will move on to item number two uh, and the adoption of the agenda and I'll look to the clerk. So we have a num number of amendments to tonight's agenda. The first is that item eight, which is presentations, and item nine, which is discussion reports. We're gonna move that to directly following the consent reports. Um, following item 7.1, we're going to actually go into closed session. There's some information that council needs before the other items, so we're gonna move it forward and do all three closed sessions at the same time. It'll be pretty fast. Um, there are two additional items to go into closed session. So the first is regarding item 7.4, which is the application for exemption to bylaw 95-212. That's regarding, um, it'll be closed session pursuant to item, sorry, section 2392F, which is advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. And the other item is related to the amendment to development charges bylaw, which is number 2021-140. That's also under section 2392F advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege. So on that item, which is the development charges bylaw, staff have received updated information from our consultants and legal counsel. And with recent changes, um, staff no longer recommend amending the development charges bylaw. Instead, the opinion is that the council resolution will suffice. And as such, a new uh, staff recommendation will be put on um, the floor for t tonight for council. It'll be that the city cease collection of the transit services component of the development charges effective January 1st. Um, with this change, a public meeting is no longer required. We'll still go through the item at the same point in the process as it was on the agenda. And there's just no public meeting. So it's being considered as a discussion report. Um, there's also an additional bylaw regarding a bylaw to appoint a chief building official and inspectors under the Ontario Building Code Act 1992. That's added as item number 16.2. That's a number of changes, but we'll walk you through them tonight. Um, and there's also additional correspondence. So the first is, um, and they're all in your sugar sink folder. First is a letter from the St. Catharines Downtown Association regarding the 2022 holiday parking promotion. The second is a confidential memorandum from the assistant at the acting city solicitor, which is legal implications regarding Reptilia's request for an exemption under bylaw number 95-212. The third is a collection of correspondence regarding item 7.4, application for exempt exemption to bylaw 95-212, Reptilia. So that's all the correspondence we've received thus far. The fourth is a memo from Financial Management Services regarding the amendment to development charges bylaw number 2021-140. All right, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? Councillor Phillips, seconded by Councillor Williamson. All those in favor? Opposed? And that is carried. Item three is the adoption of minutes. We have three sets of minutes to adopt. The minutes of the meeting of the inaugural meeting on November 21st, minutes from the budget meeting held on November 23rd, the minutes from the meeting of council on November 28th, and the minutes of the special meeting held on December 5th. Can I have a mover? Uh, Councillor Lindell seconded, Councillor McPherson. All those in favor? Opposed? And that is carried. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest this evening? Seeing none. Oh, Councillor Kushner. Yeah, conflict on uh, 8.1, Canada Games Park, since Brock University is the partner. Thank you. Okay. And just as a reminder, Councillor, if you can make sure you submit that in written statement as well, uh, there is the online form that we're all able to use. Any other declarations? 
All right, seeing none, we will move on to item number five, which is the consent reports. Following item has been requested to be moved from consent to discussion. That's the Legal and Clerk Services Upcoming Advisory Committee Structure Review. That's being moved by Councilor Williamson. Uh, and I will now look, I know Councilor Dodge had something she wanted to move as well. Yes, Mr. Mayor, it's uh, under the correspondence 6.4, item number six. 6.4.6, 6, that's the renowned sewage pumping station upgrade notice? That's correct. Okay, so that will be moved as well. Is there anything else to be moved? All right, I'm seeing nothing. So the motion that will come forward is that council approve the consent agenda, save and accept those items being brought forward for discussion. Can I have a mover for that? Councilor Kushner. And I will look to the clerk to call the roll. Sorry, I was caught off guard. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Ratzlaff? Yes. Councillor Stevens? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Mayor Cisco? Yes. And that's carried. So I will look to the clerk now to read this evening's consent agenda. Thank you. The consent agenda included item 6.1, Corporate Support Services, 2021 Status Report on the Multi-Year Accessibility Plan, item 6.2, Financial Management Services, the Draft 2023 Operating Budget, Parking Meter Reserve Update, and Preliminary Estimate. Item 6.3 was pulled from consent. Item 6.4, uh, Council Correspondence, Save It Accept Sub Item 6. And Item 6.5, uh, Financial Management Services, Safe Restart Agreement Phase 4 Funding for Municipal Transit Stream. All right. So we will move on now. We have a number of presentations tonight, both official presentations as well as presentations of members of cat or sorry members of the public uh, with respect to some of the public meetings we're having so a general declaration to all presenters uh, council chambers in our in all municipalities in our country represent the seat of local democracy uh, the many acts that govern us understand the necessity of the collective voice when decisions are being made to grow our spaces pass our bylaws and to seek opinions into very complex issues ensuring safe spaces for all in our public discourse we recognize the right of the majority to decide, the minority to be heard, the public to have an opportunity to participate, and all participants to be treated with courtesy and respect. It is imperative that elected officials, citizens and staff have input, and it is paramount that we listen to one another and question one another, but that we understand we do this in a way that never undermines any person's ability or their dignity in our chambers. We respect the right for everyone to have an opinion and remind the audience views of the public do not always reflect those of the corporation of the city of St. Catharines. With that, I will move on to 8.1, which is our first presentation on Canada Games Park and its 2023 operating budget presentation. So I'll call on Jeff Dixon, the general manager, to present the Canada Games Park's 2023 operating budget. Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Mayor Sisko. Um, good evening, Council, um, and thanks for allowing me to return to uh, to present um, the Canada Games Park 2023 budget. Um, next slide, please. And you can go one more for me, please. Next slide. Um, so Canada Games Park is um, the Walker Sports and Ability Center, as well as the outdoor space, is a multi-use sports complex that fosters the spirit of recreation for all, in addition to high-performance athletics. Next slide, please. Um, Canada Games Park, for those who have not had the opportunity to come and visit the park located um, beside Brock on Brock University campus, I'll give you a brief uh, overview of the park and, and the relationship of the City of St. Catharines um, to, uh, to Canada Games Park. First of all, Canada Games Park is made up of two areas, both indoors and outside. The indoors is named the Walker Sports and Ability Centre um, due to a generous uh, donation to the capital. And it's a large building of over 180,000 square feet of space over two levels. Two amazing ice surfaces in there that can be converted to lacrosse services. 
four hard um, wood gymnasiums, which are actually the largest sprung hardwood floor in Canada. Uh, an indoor 200 meter track, which is certified for uh, by the World Athletics. Uh, three dedicated uh, dressing rooms. Two of them are being um, occupied currently by Brock, Brock Athletics men's and women's hockey. Um, the Brock Negra Center for Health and Wellbeing is moving into uh, to the center or into the building, and they'll be opening their doors at the beginning of January to their members. Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario is also moving into the second floor of the Walker Sports and Ability Center. They'll be moving in uh, shortly, opening their doors to the public, I believe in the first quarter is the, the goal. And then of course, the legacy of Niagara 2022 being Sport Niagara is gonna be uh, calling the Walker Sports and Ability Center home as well. Next slide, please. The outdoor space, which is also just as impressive, has an eight lane, 400 meter world athletic certified track, a uh, competition grass field for, um, for throwing events, such as shot put, javelin, discus, hammer throw. Um, storage for all that equipment. It also has six beach volleyball courts um, and an open air cycling pavilion and approximately 400 dedicated free parking spots that we do monitor because our friends at Brock, uh, the, the students at Brock seem to like to come and join that parking. Next slide, please. Um, the To give a, a little bit of a reminder of just the overview of what um, the consortium and who manages the, the building itself or who, I guess, owns the Canada Games Park. The park consortium consists of, of four members, the Niagara Region, the City of St. Catharines, the City of Thorold, and Brock University. The consortium collectively owns Canada Games Park and the land is leased from Brock University. Um, all four of the consortium partners are responsible for contributing to the capital reserve. And then three of the consortium partners, St. Catharines, Thorold, and Brock University are responsible for the operating expenses. Next slide, please. ASM Global, um, who I work for, who also manages the Meridian Center, was selected um, as the independent operator um, uh, for Canada Games Park. We started on site there at the end of 20, uh, February 2022, and we deployed what we classify as our shared staffing model, which is providing administrative support level to both the Meridian Center and Canada Games Park combining our buying powers, um, operating efficiencies and industry best practices. The shared staffing model has been able to save Canada Games Park, you know, around a quarter of a million dollars. And it's saving Meridian Centre approximately $90,000 this year. Um, plus, we've been able to add increased full time staffing, um, which was much needed at Meridian Centre um, to no um, uh, impact to our budget. Next slide, please. Um, beginning in March, ASM started hiring. So this is just a, a recap of 2022, which has been a whirlwind um, as we came on on, um, on property and, and jumped into the program when the building had already uh, obtained um, substantial completion. So we jumped in in March, um, started hiring, training, and preparing the, the procedures for the venues. Uh, opened the doors in May to our friends uh, with the athletics um, and became the home of the St. Catharines Athletics Junior A, their Junior B team, and minor lacrosse. Lac lac we hosted numerous test events on, in addition to all the cross events, uh, one being the Niagara Home and Lifestyle Show. You might recall that it was at Seymour Hanna for a little while, as well as uh, in uh, Thorold for a little while. Um, and we also did the Niagara River Lions training camp through the summer, as well as a variety of, of um, uh, events prior to the, the games. So we also welcomed Brock Athletics, men's and women's hockey, and uh, this year we also have a full schedule of ice and court rentals. Of course, we also hosted the Canada Summer Games, which was um, by all accounts a, a great success for the building and the building performed exceptionally well. As we move forward to 2023, we're looking at, as we develop the 2023 budget, um, <clears throat> 
we look back at the Performa, there was an original Performa created in 2019, it was updated. We've really reflected on that Performa that was done and I, that was presented to Council um, at that time. We implemented a number of different uh, best practices and operating efficiencies locally as well as through our, our uh, global partners. Um, there was minimum cap, we expect minimum capital expenses um, due to the warranty coverage in uh, 2023. Um, we want to remind that the operating budget is shared between the three partners um, and then the capital reserve or the capital contribution, excuse me, is uh, shared between the four consortium partners. Next budget, the next slide please. Um, this is your 2023 budget. As you can see, we don't have any history to this budget. 2022 is a, is, um, a very unique year and, and um, really true operations didn't start until um, September of this year because of the games and the run up to the games. So we, we've been comparing to the Performa that was done again in 2019 to try to um, come to some comparisons and see where we have some savings or some differences. What we've been able to, to figure out is we were able to save based on the, um, the revenues, um, or, sorry, increase, be very close to the revenues and save a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, on the expenses side of it in order to uh, make sure that our net cash flow is, was better than what the Performa laid out for us. Um, there was some changes uh, to the capital reserve formula that um, was approved by the consortium of the games, which is why the uh, capital reserve is larger than what the Performa um, was originally uh, projected as um, in the Performa. Next slide, please. As we look forward, this is also uh, just a general quick uh, snapshot of what the contribution is for 2023 to the city of St. Catharines. Next sl slide, please. Some of our opportunities and challenges as we move through the year, obviously labor has been a, a bit of a challenge as we've been onboarding new people. Um, the new venues un unknowns that we consistently uh, learn our new building. The balance between the high performance legacy and the community access is, is key um, to getting that right and is being discussed um, at this time as the legacy agreement um, and plan is being put in place. And then we are always uh, conscious of the, the cost of goods and materials as they increase. Opportunities are, are endless. The, the new venue and the high demand, we are seeing um, extremely high demand for prime time um, in this venue. If you do uh, happen to visit us uh, in the evening, um, on weekends, you'll notice that there is a very, very busy uh, location with lots of, uh, of activity going on. Um, we see lots of opportunities with our friends at Brock University, Sport Niagara, and of course, both cities. We've already been able to secure um, a, a high performance um, training camp this summer um, with the support of Brock University and partnering with uh, Sport Niagara. And then the opportunity as we continue to uh, see what um, shared resources we can we can um, uh, partner with between Canada Games Park and uh, and the Meridian Center. We're finding more efficiencies as we go along. Next slide, please. And happy to answer any questions um, that I can on this beautiful facility, as you can see there. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Any questions or comments to the presenter? Councillor Garcia, followed by Councillor Williamson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Dixon, for that presentation. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, was ASM involved in developing the pro forma? Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no, we were not. It was done by Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, we were not involved at that stage of time. Okay, so. So I guess that explains some of the divergencies because I was going to ask you why the fees were higher, even though it's not large, but, uh, but I guess I was their estimate of what your fees would be. Uh, yes, through you, I, I believe that yes, that's what their fee, their estimates would be correct. 
Okay, and through you, Mr. Mayor, could you share some light again on the capital reserve? Why is it so, so much higher than was anticipated? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, if, if I can call on um, uh, Ms. Christine Douglas to uh, help me on that part. She's part of the um, committee that is more familiar with that, representing the city of St. Catherine. Yes. Not sure if Christine's on this call. Yep. Uh, thank you through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. With regards to the reserve, um, so the uh, finance um, committee um, that is made up of the four consortium partners, um, being the region of Niagara, the city of Thorold, the city of St. Catharines, as well as Brock University. So the um, contribution to the reserve is based on the value of the um, facility and the um, completed construction cost was $98.36 million. And then also to ensure that we are um, putting away dollars to replace the facility um, with the, um, when the needs arise for the various components, there is also um, a um, factor which is based on the non-residential building uh, construction price index. And that as of the second quarter of 2022 was 12.24%. So when we add that onto the cost of the facility, then the value of the facility is approximately 110.39 million. So then when we uh, multiply out the 1.5% annual contribution, we get the 1.66, and then that is divided again by the three or the four partners um, as we all um, support the uh, capital contribution for the facility. Thank you for that, <coughs> uh, Madam Director. That is understandable, um, but uh, the the presentation through you, Mr. Mayor, when we talk about the total contribution from our city being 669, uh, uh, do you know how that compares to what was uh, estimated in the performer? Or? Uh, thank you through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just going from memory because I don't have those documents in front of me, but I believe that it was, it's very comparable. Um, the pro forma had indicated that our contribution was around uh, the $660,000 um, mark on an annual basis. Thank you for that. And last question, Mr. Mayor, through you to the CAO, uh, likely. Uh, I remember I raised my concerns when we approved this in terms of the, the agreement to make sure that we weren't going to have a bottomless pit here increasing contributions. Is, does our agreement protect us in some way to make sure these contributions don't increase at, uh, at a horrendous rate? Or? Um, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the consortium agreement has to be, there's a management committee that currently has the CAO, myself, CEO of Thorold, CEO of Niagara Region, and Brock University uh, Vice President of Administration. So we go through the, the the budget program and approve it at that level, and and we all take into consideration the fact that we're you know uh, the the various budget guidances on on the various departments. So this budget, as presented, is very closely aligned to um, to the estimates that were put forward when when this initial project was um, brought to council. And we're trying to stay within that all the time. And working with ASM, we're really pushing on, you know, increasing revenues and reducing the expenditures. And up to this point, it's uh, it's been a good relationship. This 2023 will be the first year of full operation. So we'll have a really good sense of how that's going to work out. It was a little bit of a challenge with the Canada Games in 22 and, and some things have changed. So um, we're quite confident that we're going to be, well, be able to maintain that envelope over time. Okay, th thank you. Those are my questions, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you, Councillor Garcia. Councillor Williamson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon, um, community access versus Brock access. And um, in this city, um, there is a demand. We had uh, Rex Dimers, which had been converted to a volleyball facility operated by Niagara Sport and Social. And we've also lost the double, beautiful double gym at the YMCA. Um, I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit uh, in terms of we're meeting that demand. There's also demand for pick, pickleball and basketball. So I just wondered 
uh, where the usership is coming from is St. Catharines, um, uh, a big source of it, and can you accommodate these various users up there? Thank you. Uh, thank you th for the question uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I, I will have to say that the, the demand um, is greater than what we're able to to supply, um, but we are accommodating, you, you mentioned Niagara Sport and Social, we, we do um, host them on a number of feed meetings and I believe on the weekends um, but we do see some usage from you know from Thorold uh, from you know uh, minor um, uh, volleyball associations and so on as well as there has the legacy of the building and the contribution from the province and, and the federal government and so on uh, basically require us also to have some space for high performance so that is not varsity Brock is is um, a different um, organization Brock is mostly utilizing it during the non-peak times the, the I should this is gym related and, and court related they're using it during non-peak times which there is uh, a number of you know ideas or a number of availability items like pickleball um, we have spoken to many pickleball leagues uh, to come in and, and I believe that they did a test drive of the the facility um, one day as well so I'm not sure where that that landed but we are trying to accommodate excuse me sorry I'm just I'm not I'm not able to hear you I don't know if other people can but it's not that clear I just, so oh, if you, if you can could maybe you... just repeat the last couple sentences Mr. Dixon sorry to interject sorry about that can you hear me okay now yeah I think so okay um yes yeah, so uh, let me just step back so so between so that the we've been going through trying to figure out what the right um, usage is between um, high performance training versus varsity, which is Brock versus community use. And we understand the importance of all of those. We do have a higher demand than uh, space available. So right now working with the Niagara um, uh, 2022 games, they're working on their legacy plan, which will re be presented to the Canada Games Consortium Management, uh, David Oakes and the, the, the um, other CAOs. Um, they will agree to that and that will balance the usage between high performance versus what is available for the community. But right now there will be, you know, the hope is that there will continue to be quite a bit of time available for community usage, such as uh, the Niagara Sport and Social Club and others. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Phillips. Through you, <clears throat> excuse me, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, either to Mr. Dixon or um, our Director of Financial Management Services. Um, as far as the contributions from the other partners being Thorold and, and Brock in operations, are they paying the same amount of 669,000? Uh, is it equal, equal three ways or how do you determine who pays what? Uh, thank you for that question. And I can answer through the mayor is that um, the operations, the, the amounts that I showed um, that would be the amount being paid by Brock, uh, uh, Thorold, and um, St. Catharines. And then the Niagara region would only be contributing to the capital reserve at the same 414 amount that the other three partners are contributing in. And that's in accordance with the consortium agreement. So the other two, Brock and, and Thorold, are paying the same amount as we are, operation-wise. Good. And that, uh, I might have missed that on the missed the uh, the um, amount on the spreadsheet that you gave us. Uh, what's the cost of the lease that we're being charged by Brock? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe it's a dollar a year for that a sounds... thirty-eight year term. But I would want to defer that to potentially the CAO to answer that question. That's, the CAO is nodding vigorously, so adult. that's what I thought it was. I thought it was important to get that out there to make sure that everyone knows we got a really good deal from Brock. But uh, I would I would wager that Brock got a really good deal from us as well. Yes, so. that's, I I, agree, I I also agree with that, Mr. Mayor. But uh, it has been uh, in in working on that uh, that committee. It has been a uh, 
a good shared responsibility. I think Mr. Oakes would agree with that, that uh, it's worked out actually better than I, what I thought it would. All right, thank you, Councillor Phillips. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, I, uh, I was just going to jump in with some final comments and echo what Councillor Phillips said. I think this is an or sorry, this is an example of what many of us have talked about for many years, uh, shared services across municipal, ba municipal boundaries. We don't just have shared services across municipal boundaries here, also across uh, levels of government and you know, bringing Brock University uh, into an agreement with Thorold and ourselves uh, I think is paying dividends and will continue to pay dividends for the entire community. It also gives us new venues that are able to attract new opportunities to uh, Niagara, North Niagara and St. Catharines and Thorold specifically. So uh, credit to our staff team that I know works hard to, uh, to make sure that our needs and the needs of our partners are, are being met with this facility. And I look forward to the, the future future reports that come down the pipe. With that, uh, can I get a mover to receive the presentation? Councillor Phillips, seconder, Councillor Miller. Um, so this is simply to receive the presentation from the Canada Games Park regarding the proposed 2023 operating budget. All those in favor? Opposed? And that is carried. Thank you, Mr. Dixon, for your second presentation in two meetings. Sincerely appreciated. And we will now move on to item 8.2, the Niagara District Airport 2023 Operating and Capital Budget Presentation. And I will call on Dan Pilon, the General Manager, to present the Niagara District Airport's 2023 budget. Mr. Pilon. Uh, before okay. Dan starts, it's Robin Garrett. I'll just stay, I'm the Chair of the Niagara District Airport. I just wanted to make a, a couple of remarks. And first of all, thank uh, uh, Councillor Kevin Townsend for serving on the commission over the past four years and we're happy to welcome Mark Stevens uh, to the commission. Um, for those that are new to the airport and, and as a reminder to others who uh, have heard of the budget request in the past, it's a reminder that almost 50% of our budget is self-funded with the remainder of our funding provided by the three municipalities, St. Catharines, Niagara Falls and Niagara on the Lake and we do appreciate the financial support we have received from your municipality. Uh, over the past decade um, we've been working with fellow commissioners to raise the awareness of the airport and the fa fantastic asset that it is. Airports are strong economic drivers um, but our airport just has not realized its full t t potential. We need investment to develop 50 acres of available land and to attract more tenants. And uh, as well, we would like to attract uh, airlines to offer scheduled service. And in doing so, this will help offset the cost to municipalities over the long term. Um, we will continue to seek a third party investor um, for our airport and as well go after uh, funding from the provincial <clears throat> and federal levels of government and especially the Niagara region. Um, the airport is truly a regional asset after all. So uh, the budget that Dan's about to present um, is like many others over the past many years. It's a kind of keep the lights on budget. Um, uh, however, we do have some looming uh, investments that are needed and that we've been putting off for, for years. And that includes things like resurfacing one of our secondary runways. Um, but uh, we, we are cognizant of the current situation with uh, with budget requests. Um, so I'll turn it over now to Dan, who will present um, the, the ask for this year and give you a sense of what's needed for our full potential over the coming years. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Robin. And uh, first, a congratulations to uh, Mayor Sisko and all the respective council members on your on your election. Uh, an additional thank you to uh, Councillor Kevin Townsend for his guidance and support over his term on the commission, and certainly to our outgoing chair, Robin Garrett, uh, for her uh, unwavering commitment and over the last decade to the airport. She's had a steadfast belief in its capacity to support and grow our Niagara's economy, so her enthusiasm and thoughtfulness will certainly be missed. So thank you once again for having me here this morning and to members of the public and, and councillors for having me here today. Next slide. As uh, an FYI, uh, this is where we're going to be uh, moving with this presentation here. Your community representatives for St. Catharines are Greg White, our treasurer, uh, Mark Steinman, who altruistically is additionally a member of your Performing Arts Centre Board as well, 
And lastly, after 16 years of representing the city of St. Catharines uh, on the board, Mr. Henry Zwolak is stepping down to spend time on, on some more important battles that he has to fight. So thanking him dearly for his time in shaping the facility. So, uh, with that, after 93 years, uh, we'll uh, provide uh, of this facility, we'll provide some, some simple background. Again, one of uh, only 97 certified airports in Canada, one of 55 airports with an Canada flight service station. It's uh, for new councillors around the table, a 5,000 foot runway with approximately 365 acres of land and about 75 to 100 aircraft I consider as home base. Next slide. So the industry uh, in general in aviation is certainly in a much better space today. Uh, large and small airports are seeing a bounce back, but certainly not always to pre-pandemic levels as you can see by some of the information here in front of you. Uh, we provide the uh, the comparison of, uh, of a Pearson and a Hamilton, not because we consider ourselves to be in the same scenario, but just uh, to see that they're running into some of the same scenarios. Uh, business is bouncing back, but we're still not necessarily where we were in 2019. Uh, the rising cost of product is having a significant impact on all airports, large and small. As an example, jet fuel is up 215% since the beginning of 2021. Uh, aircraft parts and maintenance, much like parts and maintenance for everything, are taking significantly longer and, and costing much more. So it certainly creates a challenging environment uh, in aviation. In Niagara specifically, our data paints a really confusing story to some extent. Our revenues uh, are, are up, our movements are up, but still down compared to 2019. Our scheduled service is uh, no longer in operation. However, jet traffic is at its highest level ever in the history of the airport. So. It's certainly a bit of a confusing picture that it paints for us as we try to uh, get through that next slide. Probably the most important uh, uh, slide, but more so than any some that will follow. That's uh, our mission, vision, and values. And uh, in 2023, we'll see a new commission on board, it, one with an operating agreement that expires at the end of its term. Uh, so what is necessary uh, above all for us truly is clarity, uh, clarity of purpose, the clarity of ambition. We have a clear value statement as a regional airport, and we're in an area of half a million people with an asset with millions of dollars already invested, 13 million visitors, and we're looking to bring more, certainly. Uh, we are the 13th largest uh, CMA in Canada. However, we are most assuredly not the 13th largest airport uh, in Canada. So from our perspective, it's clarity to meet our vision, uh, clarity to create what that uh, vision is for this term of the commission, and to fulfill that statement of value to all of the municipalities in the region, but most certainly to the largest municipality in the region, St. Catharines, as well. Next slide. That's our general movement, as you can see, as they've strongly rebounded, but not completely yet. Uh, we have had the highest number of jet movements in the history of our uh, facility, and that's important because they bring in a different revenue dem demographic. There's more fuel to fill it up. There's more passenger fees. There's more landing fees, et cetera. And uh, this increase in movements is against the backdrop that we have only been open to international traffic since May of 2022. So that was when uh, our closure to international traffic was lifted due to uh, COVID and pandemic restrictions. So we're only looking at eight months of uh, full opening to uh, full traffic. Next slide. Some highlights and lowlights for where we sat, some uh, highlights, so uh, new fees brought in new and more revenues. We had a $1.5 million federal grant for new uh, airside equipment. And we had, uh, for many of, uh, of you in the room today, we're, we're certainly there. We hosted the Canada Games kickoff with three 737s and over 400 athletes uh, arriving at the facility to kick off Canada Games. So we're very excited uh, to uh, to kind of show off the facility to folks who maybe hadn't been there in some time. And, and uh, we certainly heard the question, oh goodness, I didn't realize these could land here and we could manage this. Uh, however, uh, on the flip side, uh, Fly GTA has terminated operations as, as uh, due to the pandemic, certainly not due to lack of interest, quite the opposite. The interest is high. However, the rising operating costs, uh, the aforementioned costs and a lack of pilots uh, has really made it difficult for them to continue. So they are now leaning into their charter operations and continue to operate out of, out of Toronto. Uh, our RFP for third party operations was terminated with a lack of consensus from our municipal partners on next steps, if you're aware. Um, so this year has really been uh, kind of the aviation equivalent of hitting turbulence in the midst of, uh, of sunny skies, so to speak. So uh, next slide. So these are themes for our budget this year. Uh, first, as we said, recovery. It's only been eight months and we've been open to all aspects of traffic. Um, and you know, we, we certainly have lost our scheduled service from an operational perspective. However, we still have lots of opportunities in front of us for this year and in general in the field of aviation. So we're certainly excited. I have already spoken to the need for clarity and I think we'll be pushed to find that clarity by a new commission, uh, which will be forming a new strategic plan with uh, new business opportunities this year. 
And lastly, it's time for us to develop some new, uh, some new charter operations, some scheduled service opportunities. We're work in the midst of working on a number of, of, of those opportunities as we speak. New buildings on site, we're in the midst of working on those opportunities as well. And as reference, really building the value statement for the half a million residents in Niagara and, and the 13 million tourists. We believe that's certainly a size there that can sustain and nourish enhanced air connectivity. As an aside too, as you go through this, uh, all the photos in the, uh, in the presentation are actually photos from Niagara District Airport. Uh, the vast majority of them this year as well. So uh, as an FYI, just those are all pictures from uh, from our facility. Next slide. Last year, next year, a simple scenario here. From an operating perspective, uh, we're now looking at moving forward with uh, seven days a week, 12 months a year, uh, with additional staff to attract and support. We have new seating in the terminal and advanced enhancements, and uh, certainly numerous consultancies and development applications. That's, uh, so we need to provide a clarity of what that looks like. Now we're getting into the slide for the uh, dollars for you next. This is the, where we've uh, been looking for. Next slide. So these are the numbers. The operating grant request for us in this year will have increased by uh, $26,000. So split, and that's split by the three municipalities. So it's 5.7%. Beneficially, our revenues have gone up by close to 5% as well, uh, with the expenditures increasing at approximately 5.3%. That's the fuel, the maintenance costs, and some of the personnel costs to complete a backlog of capital projects and uh, support our attempts to attract scheduled service. The detail on those is included in your budget package. Next slide. This is how it breaks down by municipality. Um, change for 2022 is that we, uh, as per the operating agreement, are mandated to use the recently released census population data. And so it changes proportionally the 250,000 residents between the three partners. Next slide. There's our five year operating uh, budget history. So proportionally, we're looking at 46% of our revenues, our, our own source revenues through a non-aeronautical and, and some mix of aeronautical, and 54% is to the municipal support of our three municipal partners. Next slide. So switching uh, runways here to capital, uh, as uh, our chair referenced, uh, it's really a fraction of the capital cost to support this Islamic to maintain, not invest in some of the areas. And we have a few sl a slide later on that speaks to that. Next slide. This is the breakdown for capital grant by municipality. So again, highlighting that the changes proportionally are a little bit different due to the fact of the using the 2022 census data that was released on November 30th of this year. So it's an overall increase of $20,000 in our capital request. Compli uh, capital projects for us are broken down into two areas, compliance, which is regulatory safety issues and sustainability. So at an airport, obviously safety is of the utmost priority. So these compliance items ensure that um, you know, we remain compliant with, uh, within a very heavily regulated industry. You can identify where they are right there. The pappies are those kind of red lights that you see in the side of a runway. So we have one that's been out for some time. So we need to replace one. We'll need to replace another. Uh, the lighting is a very expensive proposition to maintain. And the other items that have been highlighted through our annual safety audits. Next slide. On the sustainability side, it's a smaller list right here. Uh, so as we can see, changes to our airport terminal building for the enhanced flow of passengers and luggage and as they move through. Uh, some upgrades for a garage that's no longer going to be big enough to meet some increases, the $1.5 million increase to our fleet, and condition assessments for some of the buildings that we need to maintain. Next slide. Uh, we take a look at some of the items that are deferred. These numbers aren't exact. These are approximates, but uh, we do have some large items that continue to, to be uh, deferred. Our operating an airport is a capital intensive business. Uh, we have some decisions on secondary runways to replace or close, uh, some garage, some developing uh, development issues that we have. So a number of larger items that uh, we don't have in front of you here today, um, given uh, where we sit uh, at the moment. So just highlighting that there are uh, continue to be a number of capital investments that we will need to make in the short term. And then lastly, as we take a look at the last slide, and I've uh, buried the lead, so to speak, but it's the combined overall contribution by municipality. So that combined request, it's at the uh, an additional $46,000 split by three municipalities, which from a percentage perspective, given that the number is a 5.9% increase overall. For St. Catharines, that's an increase of $16,745 over last year's budget. Next slide. And uh, that is all. I'll uh, accept any questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pilon. If we have any questions or comments from members of council, Councillor Stevens. So I guess just for clarification for people who are listening at home, uh, the three-way split, uh, we pay more money in St. Catharines because we have a higher population. So that's why our contribution is higher. Is that correct? So oh, sorry, through you to the mayor, to the presenter. 
through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, as per the municipal operating agreement, it's split based on the most recent census data. So the population of the three municipalities is 250,000 and change put together. And St. Catharines carries the lion's share of that. So they take a uh, larger proportion, approximately 54% of what that looks like, which is down from the 2016 census where it was uh, closer to 56%. All right, thank you. All right, Councillor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, I would say to the CAO or maybe to yourself, um, I'll ask the question I ask every year. Um, as the chair of the board has pointed out, this is really a, a regional asset. Any progress or changes or updates regarding the region taking over this asset instead of us? The CAO is looking at me as I look at him. Uh, I, I will simply say as, as the new mayor, uh, my understanding is that the region has stepped away from any conversation at this point. Uh, the issue was, uh, for lack of a better term, muddied in the last term of council with the desire of some mayors in the region to also discuss the South Niagara Airport, which serves a completely different purpose, but it was folded into the conversation as well. And at that point, uh, I don't believe anything's moved forward on that file and the CAO is nodding. So. Uh, there is nothing thus far. Uh, I, I will say, uh, from my perspective, this term of council, well, there's some decisions that are going to have to be made with respect to the airport. Um, there, as Mr. Pilon and Ms. Garrett before him pointed out, there are coming soon some capital upgrades that need to be made. And so I think the, uh, the airport commission and the membership have to, to make some decisions as to how they're going to proceed. Um, because I, I know the hope, at least from my perspective, uh, previously being on council uh, with some of you and looking to see regionalization of this airport, that was the hope and the expectation that it would be moving in that direction. Without that happening, there's a conversation that's going to have to, to happen, not just at the commission, but around this horseshoe as well in the coming months and year uh, about the direction of the airport. So. Thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. And uh, since there is a new regional council as well, um, would it make any sense for us to raise the issue and ask, ask them again to consider it? Or? I, I believe so. Uh, I have a meeting with Chair Bradley later on this week to talk about priorities for the upcoming term, and this is one of the uh, items on my list. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from council? Seeing none. Uh, Councillor Townsend. Oh, oh, my apologies, Councillor Townsend. Um, you go right ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Cisco. Um, in regards to, I just wanted to um, say a few words uh, to the leadership at the airport in uh, Dan uh, Pilon and Robin Garrett. We're very fortunate to have uh, such an excellent chair and a CEO at that airport. Uh, two individuals who, who care very deeply about the airport. There's a lot of potential with this airport. Uh, we did recently at council uh, approve a potential um, private group to run the airport, but uh, that was, uh, as you know, you need all three municipalities on board for a decision to go through. But I will say that um, there's a lot of potential with this airport. There's a lot of interest in this airport. And uh, I think over the next year, year and a half, uh, we're going to see some exciting things happening out of the Niagara District Airport. I also want to um, uh, thank uh, Henry Swolock, who's been on that board for as mentioned uh, 16 years it's uh, sad to see Henry uh, step down but he's been uh, a, a strong leader at that board for the city of St. Catharines uh, also to Greg White and Mark Steinman uh, who have been uh, key advocates for, for the city of St. Catharines uh, so um, I'll leave it at that but uh, the airport is a gem in the community and we will see some exciting things happening uh, in the next year year and a half all right thank you Councillor Townsend any others all right, seeing none, uh, thank you, Mr. Pilon, as well. Thank you, uh, Ms. Garrett and uh, Mr. White, who was on the call as well. Uh, sincerely appreciated your input this evening. Can I have a mover to receive the presentation? Councilor Garcia seconded, Councilor Townsend. Uh, the council received the presentation from the Niagara District Airport regarding the proposed 2023 operating budget. All those in favor? Opposed, and that is carried. 
All right, we will move on to nine, the discussion reports, uh, as the agenda was moved around a little bit. So we have item 9.1, economic development and tourism services and community recreation and culture services. Uh, I'll now call on Darren Dobler, the governor and general manager of the Ice Dogs, to provide a summary of his proposal for support for the 2024 Memorial Cup bid. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for, for giving me the time today. I know you guys have a pretty uh, full docket, so I'll, I'll make this uh, short and sweet. Um, the Ice Dogs are putting in for the Memorial Cup for the 2024 season. The Memorial Cup, uh, for those of you who may not be aware, it crowns the champion of the Western Hockey League, the Quebec Major Junior League, as well as the Ontario Hockey League. So. Those three champions will play along with the host team. Hopefully that is the Ice Dogs in 2024. So just based on, on past um, data of the Memorial Cup, which is held every year, it brings uh, 10 to $15 million in economic revenue to the host team and area. Um, it's played over 10 days uh, 24, it'll be May 24th till June the 2nd. Um, statistics show that they always average 90% of capacity in the facility. Um, the CHL alone is is looking for, they, they require 255 hotel rooms for 10 nights. So, um, you know, that's very large with the four teams and the fans, plus whatever parents, friends, family, fans, spectators come to uh, St. Catharines. We feel that this would be very, you know, beneficial. It's a nationally televised event. Um, it would bring a lot of attention to St. Catharines, to our brand new Canada Games Park, and to our beautiful facility, the Meridian Center. Um, we are requesting, we are requesting um, that the fees be waived. In other words, uh, we're looking for free ice time, free rent for those 10 days, um, as well as a practice facility that's required, hopefully the, the, the Canada Games Park. This is going to be at no risk whatsoever to the city of St. Catharines. What we are looking for um, in this is just free soft costs. So there would be no risk. We have to do a financial guarantee to the CHL, the Canadian Hockey League, um, guaranteeing X amount in revenue when we get our budget together. And that's usually in the 1.5 to $2 million range that you have to guarantee. So in layman's terms, if we guarantee 2 million, but only bring in 1.8, then the ice dogs will be on the hook for the extra two hundred thousand dollar shortfall. We are not looking to the city for this whatsoever. We are just looking for free rent, free ice for those ten days. Um, I don't really have a whole lot much else to say. We have some notables that are going to be joining us, helping us. Uh, most importantly, most notable would be Doug Hamilton. So he's already agreed to come help us. Um, he's familiar, obviously, with the Canada Games. So he's agreed to help the Ice Dogs in this bid. And once we get it, hopefully speaking optimistically, we will get it. Then uh, he will sit on the committee and, and help it run. Uh, so, Mayor, that's about all I really have to say. Just short and sweet, straight to the point. Um, it's, it'd be a great, you know, national attraction for the city, um, and we're really looking for your support. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Dodobler. And I will say short and sweet and straight to the point is exactly what we are looking for on a night like tonight. I have uh, a number of hands up. Uh, I saw Councillor Townsend followed by Councillor Kushner. So I look to Councillor Townsend. And I'm actually, Councilor Townsend, before you begin, I will ask as a, we will be uh, speaking just to the presentation right now. Uh, if you have questions or comments for staff related to the staff report, hold on to that until we've made the motion to receive the presentation and then we are into uh, discussion of the report. I just want to make sure we phase this properly. So questions strictly to the presentation by Mr. Dodobler. Councilor Townsend. 
Thank you, uh, Mayor Cisco. Through you to Darren, what has been the public, uh, the public, um, I guess, what has reaching out to the public? What has been their reaction to your bid? So far, it's been very positive. Uh, the city of St. Catharines, the fans have wanted this for a long time. Previous ownership group didn't want to uh, risk, and, and there is some sort of risk, but we don't believe there is. But there, the, the previous ownership didn't want to risk a financial loss, so they just didn't do it. But I'm willing to risk that. I've seen the support. I've seen the support, you know, prior to my ownership. So I'm very confident that with a, you know, a lot of work and an accurate budget, that there won't be a loss. And if if there is a loss, I'm willing to absorb that. Thank you. And. Uh you know, it's, it's very exciting to see a new owner come into our community um, to push something like this forward. Um, when first elected, I continuously did mention it would be great to have a Memorial Cup here in, in St. Catharines. And uh, as someone who has um, been uh, in attendance at an RBC, RBC Cup in Chilliwack, you're, you can see the effect it has on a community, uh, bringing people from across the country into a, a community who will be using the restaurants and the hotels. Um, thank you for that. And also, if you are looking for uh, two washed up uh, players, uh, overagers, Councillor Miller and myself uh, are former uh, hockey players. So just uh, keep us on uh, on notice. Thank you. That was, you know what, I, I sorry, I appreciate the support and it made me think of something else too. So this would, you know, like you say, you talk about the RBC Cup, this would open up uh, our doors to hosting other events like the Prospect Game, maybe possibly even the World Juniors. Um, we have the greatest facility I've seen in, in the Ontario Hockey League and probably in the CHL. So we're very excited. Thank you. I, I will just applaud Councillor Townsend for the most shameless plug for beer league hockey players to try and get on an important sheet of ice that I have ever heard in a council meeting. Well done. Uh, Councillor Kushner. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The comment was made that... It, the comment was made that if there is a deficit... That would be absorbed by the owner. And the question that follows, which is good news, of course, and if there is a surplus, what happens to that surplus? So when you put the budget in, one of, I, I guess I'm dodging the question a little. So the surplus, I guess, would we would like to invest some of it, um, not all of it, but some of it back into the community. Um, part of your budget that you put together is if, you know, Mr. Dixon feels there's any upgrades that need, we put that into the facility, maybe a new PA system, something like that. That's silly because it's got a great sound system. But, um, you know, anything that we feel we may need, that's part of the budget. So that would be part of the expenses. But the surplus, to answer your question directly, um, I'm assuming most of that would go to the Ice Dogs. Um, and hopefully we can put it back right into the community. Okay, thank you for your response and good luck. Thank you very much. Council Phillips. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Prior to your submission, uh, do, will there be a committee or a group of people from the CHL visiting each site to get an idea of what each site has to offer? It's part of the presentation. There are four teams in the OHL that um, have put in for the 24. So the committee, which isn't just OHL people, it's CHL people, will be out visiting each of the facilities to make sure that it meets you know, the standards. But we have no fear of not meeting any standards with that beautiful facility. OK, so they don't send a committee to really scope the site before they award the uh, the games yeah they, they will they will okay thank you well, because they have to make sure that you know our presentation is exactly what we say it is but part of our presentation then they'll, they'll narrow it down from four down downward probably to one or two you know but at that time yeah they will be inspecting the facilities okay, great thank you good luck Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions or comments? 
All right, well then, can I have a mover and a seconder for the presentation? Uh, Councillor Phillips, Councillor Stevens, all those in favor? That's carried. So now on to the recommendation in the report. And if I could ask for the recommendation just to be put up onto the screen. So we see the recommendation on the screen. The council endorsed the Niagara Ice Dogs bid application to host the Memorial Cup tournament and direct staff to work with the Ice Dogs on the bid application and the council support the request to waive the associated fees. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, Council, Councillor Townsend, Councillor McPherson, any questions or comments? Councillor, I've got Councillor Williamson and then Councillor Kushner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to uh, CAO or whoever would like to answer. Um, th th they are that, we'd like to call them St. Catharines Ice Dogs, but they are the Niagara Ice Dogs. And some of these economic benefits will be spread uh, beyond uh, the boundaries of St. Catharines, particularly Probably Niagara Falls will have some hotel room rentals, et cetera. Um, is there a way that Niagara Falls or the region, once again, could share in some of these costs? Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the region of Niagara Economic Development is supporting the bid application financially, the bid application itself. In terms of a, a hosting investment, there is a uh, community roundtable that's set up for Wednesday morning, so we're inviting all partners in. Uh, well, the Ice Dogs and Sport Niagara is inviting all partners, area partners in for a discussion on how best to support the bid. So there's a possibility that some of these costs could be offset by other municipality or the region stepping in? Certainly through you, through you Mr. Mayor, perhaps uh, the private sector as well. Good. Thank you very much. Sorry. Councillor Kushner followed by Councillor Miller. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The concept of sports tourism was introduced several years ago. And uh, to the Director of Business Development, what has been the impact uh, of that strategy to increase our tourism by sports tourism? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the concept of sport tourism has certainly taken off in St. Catharines uh, and Niagara, uh, and we see the benefit of that through the former Sport Commission, which landed the Canada Summer Games. Uh, to that end, Sport Niagara will eventually replace that, that former entity. But here in the city of St. Catharines, this council and, and well, previous council, many of you are on it, um, have supported similar requests uh, in that the FIBA U18 event, so the basketball event that we hosted at the Meridian Center, the Scotty's Tournament of Hearts, the Briar bid was a larger ask than what's in front of you today, which was a cash commitment as well as fee waiver commitment, and certainly the, um, the, uh, the Women's World Junior Hockey uh, Championships that we held at Meridian Center. So there is past practice of success here, and the hoteliers certainly support, uh, support this as well. Okay, thank you. And my follow-up question is, uh, you indicated when the other organizations ask for cash, uh, they are not asking for cash. There's no cash outlay, I should say, because I assume that if, um, if the games don't come here, that there's no revenue displacement that the arena would remain empty. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, there is a cash investment that's included in the, um, in the staff report, and that's capital improvements to the Meridian Center for, to be able to host this event. So that's around $60,000. Everything over and above is an offset, cash in, cash out through fee waiver. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kushner. Councillor Miller, followed by Councillor Stevens. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a question. In the report, it mentions that one of the things the, the committee, the, the decision-making committee is looking for is sort of a commitment from the municipal level and local government. I'm just curious if we know what other municipalities that have hosted the Memorial Cup or what the other municipalities in Ontario that are looking to host the Memorial Cup. Is this a standard practice to waive these kinds of fees? Through you, Mr. Mayor, it most certainly is. Uh, our competitors have yet to bring any reports before council that we've been able to find. Um, however, looking at comparator municipalities who have hosted this, it's, we're very much in line. Okay, and just out of curiosity, I guess, um, the municipal accommodation tax was looking at something like uh, tourism. In the future, would, th would we be able to use that fund to offset this cost if we wanted to or so desired, or is that sort of specifically set up for, for other things other than waiving of fees? Yeah, through your worship, uh, the MAT is precisely uh, the, the source for future investments in sport tourism. 
But could uh, I guess what I'm asking, like instead of an outward investment where maybe we are submitting bids or doing marketing or something like that, would we be able to use that fund for something like to reimburse the city for this these wage fees? Through you, Ms. Mayor, it's something that could be explored. Uh, I've not seen it in practice yet. Uh, typically, you're using the MAT to purchase an event, buy an event, um, co-invest an event financially, but it's something we could certainly explore once we're able to roll funding. Okay, yeah, I get, and I, I think you kind of partially answered this. Um, just with relation to the business community and obviously the greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce isn't just the St. Catharines Chamber of Commerce. Is there conversations with them about um, how they might be able to contribute to this bid? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, the GNCC is part of the, the working session uh, scheduled for Wednesday morning. Okay, thank you, that's it. And I will be very happy to be a spectator and not on the ice if we do host the Memorial Cup. I'd have to find my skates first. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Stevens. Sorry. Sorry. Well, just one question uh, in regards to the, the, the parking waiver. Would we still, we would not be uh, charging the event parking for the actual events then, or is this something else for the parking uh, giveaway? If you, yeah, for sure. you, Mr. Mayor, this, uh, this event requires a significant amount of real estate, uh, and as such, the parking uh, space has been identified as an area for storage as well as programming. So in, in addition to the road closures and programming the street area uh, for the festivalization, uh, the intent is to utilize the lower level parking lot and then identified in the report the raceway, the raceway parking lot, race street parking lot, sorry, um, for storage and or event related uh, activities. Councillor Phillips. Through you, Mr. Mayor. But to add to that, we're going to have two parking garages that are probably going to be full for, for 10 days, which we will be charging parking for. And it might not be five bucks. But uh, anyways, who knows? Uh, we'll, get that, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Anyways, strongly, strongly support this, this bid. Uh, when, when you think of it, a long time ago when we built the Meridian Center, uh, there was always talk the Memorial Cup was going to be here, and, and you were on council at that time, Mayor. And, and here's our first chance of, of doing that. So we as a council, I believe, have to get firmly behind this and support it. Uh, when you think back, the Scotties brought national attention to St. Catharines. Um, the Canada Summer Games did. We have the uh, 2024 World Rowing Championships coming here. It is a, a sports destination, as Councillor Kushner said, and this is one more feather in our hat cap if we can get it. It's, again, national exposure, uh, and uh, I think we'd be foolish not to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Phillips. Are there any other comments all right i will uh, i will close things up here um i appreciate a number of councillors have raised a lot of the things I, I would have wanted to talk about had they not been raised uh it's important to note though i think mr york mentioned it and it was referenced by a few um since we built the meridian center we've been asked for almost exactly the same thing a number of times for fiba basketball for the double ihf under 18 women's championships for the scotties for the canada summer games uh for the briar of those five events, we were successful in four of them. And I think many of us, if not all of us, were able to enjoy those events. And I really appreciate Councillor Phillips bringing up the Scotties right there because the Scotties was the first time for me anyways, watching television at home, watching a major national event in that particular case and seeing the city of St. Catharines logo scrolling down the screen every time a shot was taken. Uh, and there's a sense of pride, but there's also a sense of recognition that we built a facility for these purposes and it's being used for these purposes. And I will say as a counselor who was sitting in the horseshoe in 2011 when we made that decision, there were a lot of people in the community who said, oh, you'll never be able to do this. You'll never get these events. They're not coming here. And they are, and they do. And Councillor Phillips said it, when we built this facility, one of the specific events that we were looking to host uh, was the Memorial Cup. And this is our first uh, opportunity. I want to thank Darren and the Ice Dogs, the entire Ice Dogs team for bringing this opportunity to us. Uh, I'm very hopeful and very optimistic. I, I do think we have the premier facility in Ontario at the very least, if not across the CHL. And that's not just hometown pride. That's uh, officials within the CHL saying this is one of the best, if not the best facilities at the 
uh, amateur level across the country. And so we should look forward to the opportunity to showcase it. I, I do sincerely hope this is a unanimous vote. It's been a unanimous vote every other time we've been presented with this option. Uh, and an 80% success rate out of those five events says to me that when this council is united, uh, that portends good things for the community. So with that, I will uh, look to the clerk. We have a mover and a seconder, so I will look to the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Townsend? 100% yes. Councillor McPherson? Absolutely yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Ratzlaff? Yes. Councillor Stevens? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Mayor Sisko? Yes. And that's carried. Councillor Harris, I'm almost positive that was unanimous. Look at that smile. All right, wonderful. Uh, we will move on to item 9.2, legal and clerk services and the appointment of the deputy mayor. So last week, staff emailed the members of city council and requested that anyone interested in serving as deputy mayor submit their name to the office of the city clerk. Councillors Phillips and Dodge have put their names forward. Uh, we'll go to a ballot system for those councillors in person. Uh, for the councillors on Zoom, please email Kristen Sullivan and Sarah McWilliams now with who you would like to appoint as deputy mayor. Staff will then tally the results to prepare the motion for council's consideration. And as a reminder, the procedure bylaw requires that ballots be recorded in the meeting minutes. Now, in the interim, Madam Clerk, can I move on to item 9.3? And we will come back to 9.2 as after the ballots are counted. So item 9.3 is actually, for those of us following along in agendas, 6.3 move from consent. This is legal and clerk services and the upcoming advisory committee structure review. Uh, and this was requested uh, to be moved to discussion by Councillor Williamson. So Councillor Williamson, are you willing to make the staff recommendation in the report? Um, if I could just to get it on the floor, yes. perhaps. Yeah, thank you. And then I just have, and I apologize to the clerk. She's departing. Um. <laughs> she, she's listening. She can hear you. <laughs> and I apologize for not being able to uh, have a discussion about this, but I do work during the daytime. Um, and just for clarification, um, the, the, the concern I have is it suggests that the committees could be uh, paused until Q2, which uh, April, May range, and some committees like, for example, the Clean City Committee will need to meet to organize their cleanup, which is in April, for example. And um, I, I just wondered um, in, in terms of timing if um, it could be done sooner than the second quarter. So through the mayor, we will bring back the report as quickly as possible. We do want to make sure we have the time to get the input from both councillors as well as all the staff that work with the committees saying, how does this work with where the city is going strategically? Um, but keeping in mind that the committees would still have the ability to meet at the discretion of the staff if they need to move something forward. So a perfect example came up, the first round is, the next round is skip funding. We'll still call that committee together if we haven't made a decision yet, so that meeting can take place and the decision can take, make, take place. I would suggest the same would happen for an event that has been, always been held Earth Week um, since, for decades, so. Thank you, and I knew you'd consider that, uh, or have considered that. Um, I guess the other question is, um, this is my train of thought here a little bit, um, oh, the feedback in terms of, you, you said there was forms sent out. What, did you get a very good response from the committee members? Through the mayor, um, not as great as we would have loved. We would have loved 100%, but I think we got, I can't remember, I want to say at least 100 surveys back. 
oh, of committee okay, members. Good, good. And then uh, my other thought was, is would there be value in getting these people together to discuss uh, those issues, or will be there will be, there be an opportunity before the staff report comes back? I would say let's hear from the councillors first, the staff first, and then as need be, meet with either um, committee chairs or committee members, depending on the situation. Um, we're dealing with a couple hundred people. Um, definitely not going to have them all in one room to make a decision that will never work, but um, bringing maybe uh, certain people information at set decision-making points can help us get to a place where um, the m current members will support this, uh, the decision coming forward. Thank you for the information, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And staff recommendation, okay. Uh, Councillor, uh, before we do that, I've got Councillor Williamson moving the staff recommendation. Can I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Lindell. Uh, Councillor Miller. Just, um, I understand um, why those legislative committees are going forward and why the other ones are being paused. I'm just curious if the other, and probably a lot of committees are, might be thankful for that, or committee members, but if a committee did want to meet or did feel something was, was important to meet about, um, that of course those individuals could meet on their own accord, but could the chair ask to, f to have a meeting in that intervening however long it's going to be? So through the, ma the mayor, in that situation, we would ask the committee members to come forward to staff and explain the need for the meeting and okay. the timeliness of it. And then we could work with the staff to move that forward on an as needed basis. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Thank you. Council Garcia. Thank you, Mr. I mean, mayor. Just, just, sorry, uh, just followed by Councilor Townsend. Yeah. A follow up question to what Councilor Miller just asked. Uh, uh, procedural law to you to the clerk. It seems to me in the past we have essentially um, the committees have been non-existent after the election until new committees are appointed. But we're saying now, until we get this report, um, if the, uh, a committee meeting was held, either at the call of the chair or through working with staff, um, are those members, official members, so that they would constitute a quorum? Through the mayor, um, we've used some different practices in the past. 2018, we continued on with the current members and the current terms of reference until we appointed new people. And I think that happened in about March. Um, in pri pr years prior to that, we have sometimes pressed pause. The council's appointment policy for agencies, boards, and commissions has, when you appoint a member, they actually serve to the end of the term of council or they continue on until they're replaced by council. We know that uh, elections can cause some disruption, but uh, we wanna make sure that if needed, they can continue to function until council may, has the ability to make a new decision on who to be appointed. Thank you for that. And I uh, just uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, agree with Councillor Williams so that anything we can do uh, to get that report back as soon as possible would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Council Garcia. Council Townsend. Thank you, Chair. Through you, my, my question is um, along the lines of Car um, Councillor Garcia's question. Uh, so currently, we do have committee members, but at what point do the committees get dissolved and uh, replaced or um, members um, get added? So through the mayor, once we've done our review, we'll bring a report to Council saying, here's what committees we suggest be created for the next term, and here's which one we think should continue on and which one should be dissolved. At that point in time, anyone that's in dissolved, those members will cease to serve. Um, any of the committees that are continuing and need to meet, they would meet with the current members, but we would initiate our call for applicants right away, and that usually takes six weeks to two months, given the volume we're dealing with. Thank you. And through the chair, this, I assume, is including the pillar committees as well. Through the mayor, can you can you clarify which committees? The pillar committees, so the environmental, culture, uh, cultural sustainability, the ones that the councillors uh, sit on. Through the mayor, yes, the committee review will look at the structure, which includes the pillar committees. And right now, the only people that are appointed to the committees are either chairs of the other uh, committees and or councillors. So we would deal with any appointments within that, whatever the new structure is, when we bring forward a recommendation. Thank you. All right. Seeing no other questions or comments, I will look to the clerk to call the roll. 
Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Lindell. Yes. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Ratzoff. Yes. Councillor Stevens. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. And Mayor Cisco. Yes. And that's carried. All right. If we could go back to 9.2. And that would be Councillor Phillips being appointed to the deputy mayor for January 1st, 2023 to December 31st, 2024. If I can have a mover and a seconder. Councillor McPherson, Councillor Ratzlaff. And I will look to the clerk to call the roll. Mr. Mayor, just, just a quick question, I'm sorry. We, <clears throat> we are only appointing a deputy mayor uh, based on the last approval for the two years, right? That's correct. So. So for the following two years, we will just have another vote and it could be we will whoever go, applies at the time. That's right. We will go through this process again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Ratzlaff. Yes. Councillor Stevens. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Lindell. Yes. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Mayor Cisco. Yes. That's carried. Congratulations, Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Council. All right, we will now move on to item seven and the first of our four public, sorry, three public meetings this evening. The first one is 7.1 Financial Management Services, the stop up, close, and declaring surplus part of Hogan's Alley. Uh, notice of the recommendation to stop up and close and declare surplus part of Hogan's Alley has been published in accordance with the city's notice bylaw. Uh, the public meeting will proceed as follows. Members of the public were provided with options to submit written correspondence regarding this evening's public meeting. No items of written correspondence were submitted. Members of the public wishing to speak to the item were advised to RSVP with the office of the city clerk by 9 a.m. today and no one requested to speak. So the public meeting will be closed and staff will respond to any questions. Public meeting has now opened. No one has requested to speak. There is no staff presentation. I will now call for a motion to close the public meeting. I can have a motion to close the public meeting. Councillor Phillips, Councillor Stevens. Um, all those in favor, closing the public meeting. Opposed? That is carried. I guess I had to do that, which is great for me because I enjoy it. Uh, can I get a councillor to move the recommendation in the report? I will. Moved by Councillor Harris, seconded by Councillor Kushner. And the staff recommendation is on the screen. So at this point, uh, we will have debate. Yes, have no fear. I promise there will be debate. Um, so any councillors with questions, comments, or concerns? Councillor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We do have something in closed session. Do we keep questions for then or? So if it's a question related to something in closed session, um, specific to legalities moving on from this, yes. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I guess I will keep it to closed session. I, I do have one question regarding uh, what you just said, and that is about the notice. I think that I read that, and I don't know if that's a, a closed session matter, I don't think so. Uh, I believe the report says that the, the public notice was posted on the city's website. Um, <clears throat> is that sufficient? Like, I mean, we know that we have a hassle all the time because people don't really look at the website. Is that, you know, do we, do we not have to post it somewhere else? So through the mayor, the city's notice bylaw was updated 2014, 2015 or so to change notice um, from the newspaper to the website. The exception is when there's a legislation that says we need to provide it in the newspaper, um, but all of these types of notices are on the website. Councillor Ratzlaff. Yeah, I just have a question about the, uh, the easement public access. What does that look like, like in practice? So just because I'm, I'm new here, like what does an easement like? Does that dictate, you know, what they can build on it, or can we can people still drive on it, walk on it? 
Like what, what does that look like in practice? Just curious. Ms. Douglas seems to be loading up to answer this question, so I'll look to Ms. Douglas. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to the councilor. The easement um, in this particular situation would be a pedestrian access. It would also provide um, for delivery access to the businesses that front on Lakeport Road. Just to follow up then, so that means it remains like a, a road that could be driven on if needed be like it means that it can't be like it won't be built on become like a storefront or something like that uh, through the mayor to the councillor um yes there would be um i'm not exactly sure what the um the the full plan um, will be when the um, development is completed but the the access will remain open, whether it's for vehicle traffic, like I had indicated, it's it's for deliveries and for pedestrian traffic. That's our understanding um, at this time with that particular access. And I believe Ms. Kate is waiting to speak. There we go. Thank you. Through the mayor to the councillor, the Hogan's Alley is proposed to remain open as a pedestrian thoroughfare that will be um, owned by the condominium corporation eventually, but the public easement means that it will be open to the public in terms of walking on. And as the director of financial management services said, there are some properties along Lakeport that will have to have access at the rear of those buildings. So the easement will also permit occasional deliveries and um, loading at the rear of those properties, but it will not be open for personal vehicle use. It'll be for pedestrians only and occasional loading and unloading. And that's part of the um, part of the development proposal that was agreed to by the, the city, the Conservancy and the Tribunal. Yeah, that's helpful, thanks. Councilor Kushner. Thank you. Who is responsible for the maintenance of the easement? Through the mayor to the councillor, the, the property will be purchased by the uh, property owner, who's the developer right now, and then turned over the condominium corporation. They will be responsible for maintenance, but the easement is to allow the public to access that area. So it will be an open thoroughfare for the public to use, but it will be owned and maintained by the condominium corporation. Thank you. Councilor Ratzliff. Sorry, just one more follow-up question. Through the mayor, what is, like, why do they want to buy it then? Like, if they have to take on the risk and the cost, what's, what's in it for them, I guess? Through the mayor to the councillor, it's um, mainly underground. The parking structure that will be built will be underneath, um, underneath Hogan's Alley and up to the corner uh, where Lakeport meets what we call the street with no name, but could be the end, tail end of Main, Main Street will also be a building on that corner. So the parking garage and the parking structure will go underneath Hogan's Alley to that corner. And it's also because there will be um, a lot of the underground functional services will be running through Hogan's Alley. So gas lines, water, sanitary, things like that, that will be ultimately the ownership and maintenance of the condominium corporation. All right, thanks. All right, are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I will look to the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Ratzlaff. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Stevens. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Lindell. Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. And Mayor Cisco? Yes. That's carried. All right, at this time we're gonna be heading into closed session, so I will look to the clerk to read the reason for going into closed. So there's three reasons for closed session. The first is financial management services, property matter disposal, closed pursuant to Municipal Act Section 239-2C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board, Hogan's Alley Realty File Number 21-054. 
The second one is application for exemption to bylaw 95-212 Reptilia, closed pursuant to Municipal Act Section 239-2F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. And then the third item is the amendment to the development charges bylaw. It's closed pursuant to Municipal Act Section 239-2F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. As going into closed session, we will ask anybody in the gallery who is not part of the closed session to leave the building, I'm sorry, just leave the room, go down to the other hallway. We'll call you back when we're finished. By attending the closed session, each member acknowledges that their obligations under the code of conduct including responsibilities related to the confidentiality of closed session materials and discussions remain the same as if they were physically present at the meeting. This includes that members are not permitted to record the proceedings and must ensure that no other person can see or hear any of the confidential deliberations taking place. So at this point, I will ask for a mover, mover and a seconder to go into close. Councilor McPherson, Councilor Williamson. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So we will be moving into the closed session.
And we are back. Wonderful. So coming out of a uh, closed session, we have a couple of motions that we do need to pass. The first one, can I have a mover and seconder for uh, the property disposition? Uh, Councillor McPherson, Councillor Phillips. Council approved the staff recommendation in report FMS 201-2022, Realty File 21.054. Can I look to the clerk to call the roll? Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor, Mc Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Harris? I'll come back. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? I am wondering if maybe we can't hear the people that are online. No, I was muted. I was muted. I didn't okay, Councillor Harris? Is that there your you know. Are you a yes or a no, Councilor Harris, on the um, property disposition? Yes. Councilor Dodge? Yes. Councilor Ratzlaff? Yes. Councilor Stevens? Yes. Councilor Townsend? Yes. Councilor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Sisko? Yes. And that's carried. On uh, 15.2, uh, that the verbal update from the city solicitor be received for information on uh, exemption to bylaw 95 212 Reptilia. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Councilor Ratzlaff, Councilor Stevens, clerk. Councilor Ratzlaff? Yes. Councilor Stevens? Yes. Councilor Townsend? Yes. Councilor Williamson? Yes. Councilor Dodge? Yes. Councilor Garcia? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor Kushner? Yes. Councilor Lindell? Yes. Councilor McPherson? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Cisco? Yes. And that's carried. Just by way of understanding, so those are anybody who's tuning in tonight for this particular choice, that was just for the verbal update we got. It has nothing to do with the actual decision making process, just that we received an update. Uh, and then number three is the amendment to development charges by lot number 2021-140 that the verbal update from the city solicitor be received for information. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Lindell, Councillor Williamson, clerk. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Ratzlaff? Yes. Councillor Stevens? Yes. And Mayor Sisko? Yes. And that's carried. Now, before I go any further, there was one item from the consent agenda that was moved and that I neglected to get to before we moved into other areas. So uh, item 6.4, number six, which is respect to public notice for the renowned pumping station. I know Councillor Dodge had asked that that be pulled uh, so that she could speak to it. So the motion on the floor will simply be to receive for information purposes, but Councillor Dodge, you have the floor to speak to that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The reason I pulled that was because I think that it's important that um, the public are uh, brought up to uh, date as, in as many ways as we can possibly do that. And speaking with staff, I know that they said that they um, advertise this socially, but um, this is quite a could be quite a large project uh, affecting many people and I would like to see this posted on the uh, city website and uh, I look forward to staff coming through with other ways that we can reach the public with important information and I know that this is a regional project in the city of St. Catharines and that our questions should be sent to the region but I think that it would be um, a good information that we put on our website so that the public have another venue of getting this information. All right, so can we take that as a direction to staff? Okay, so motion to receive with a direction to staff. I have Councillor Dodge, uh, Councillor Phillips will second that. Um, any other questions or comments with respect to this? All right, all those in favor? Opposed? So that's carried uh, and that will be a direction to staff to make sure that that is advertised beyond the normal social channels to ensure that residents are aware of the, uh, the environmental assessment that's ongoing with respect to that project. So move on to 7.2, financial management services and uh, the development charges. And I'm just waiting for language to go up on the screen so that we're all very clear about the language. So 
So the motion is, whereas the Niagara region will begin collecting Niagara regional, sorry, regional transit development charges due to the consolidation of transit uh, effective January 1st, be it resolved that the city of St. Catharines cease collection of the transit services component of the city development charge effective January 1st. Can I have a mover and a seconder for this? Councilor Phillips, Councilor Kushner. Any debate, any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, I will look to the clerk to call the roll. Mm -hmm. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Stevens? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Ratzlaff? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. And Mayor Sisko? Yes. And that's carried. All right. Item 7.3, financial management services uh, and the updated 2023 capital budget for your forecast and asset management status. Uh, notice of consideration of the 2023 capital budget for your forecast and asset management status has been published in accordance with the city's notice bylaw. So the public meeting will proceed as follows. We will begin with uh, a staff explanation of the proposal uh, followed by members of the public who were provided with options to submit written correspondence. We received uh, none. Members of the public wishing to delegate were advised to RSVP with the Office of the City Clerk by 9 a.m. today. No one requested to speak, so we will close the public meeting at that point, and then staff can respond to questions and council can debate the motion. Uh, the public meeting is now open, and I will call upon Anthony Martuccio, the Director of Engineering, Facilities, and Environmental Services, and Richie Chung, Capital Planning Supervisor, to present on the updated 2023 capital budget for your forecast and asset management status. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councillors, citizens, and senior staff. Before you tonight is the proposed 2023 capital budget and for your forecast for your consideration and approval. This, pre this presentation is a condensed version of what was presented on November 23rd when the capital budget was first tabled. Please note that there is one small change to the Seymour Hanna dehumidification project of $500,000, which staff will fund with reserves and transfers from other capital projects surpluses. As we move through this inflationary environment, staff will continue to provide updates to council with the quarterly reports on the status of our capital projects. The proposed 2023 capital budget includes a total funding level of $71,912,580 to address corporate needs and priorities to better service the residents and businesses in our community. Work Works include asset renewal, repair, and expansion to our core infrastructure, which includes assets like water main, sewers, and transportation systems, as well as significant work to our non-core infrastructure, which includes assets like our facilities, natural assets, fleet, and IT systems. The development of the capital budget was a collaborative effort amongst the various city departments and includes projects to address the corporation's highest priorities. It recognizes the need to ensure that all city owned infrastructure assets are sustainable into the future so that we can continue to provide basic core services as well as the desire to enhance the quality of life for our residents and minimize environmental impacts while recognizing our economic challenges. The budget was developed to support the priorities identified in the St. Catherine strategic plan while being guided by the direction provi provided in the various council approved corporate strategies and master plans. In 2019, council declared a climate emergency and has since approved various initiatives and plans to help mitigate and adapt to climate change. This capital budget includes approximately 5.1 million for projects that continue to support climate change and environmental stewardship through projects that improve or protect our natural assets and improve the efficiency of our facilities. This budget also includes approximately 8.5 million of projects that support active and healthy living. Staff continue to work on the city's active transportation master plan, which will serve as a critical document that will guide future capital and operating budget decisions related to active transportation in our community. However, in the meantime, the proposed budget includes an al allocation of approximately 2.8 million for the continued expansion and renewal of active transportation networks that, that support alternative modes of transportation. 
approximately 5.7 will also support the expansion and renewal of our recreation and parks amenities. And now I'll pass it over to Richie Chung, Capital Planning Supervisor. Thanks, Anthony. All the projects included in the 2023 budget total 71.91 million. Consistent with prior years, we fund these expenditures from a variety of sources, which is included in the breakdown of the table on the slide. Of note is the Canada Community Building Fund, which is formerly called the Federal Gas Tax Fund, seems to provide an ongoing source of funding year over year. This has been reduced in half, as in the prior year, the federal government announced only a one-time double. Reserve contributions include funding from the Building Improvement Reserves, Meridian Event Fund, and the Meridian Center Capital Reserves, with the majority of the funding of over $5 million from the reintroduced development charges and community benefit charges. This will ensure that growth pays for growth capital. Tax support and water and wastewater rates and capital revenue total $17 million. The balance of the funding comes from debt, which is providing 60% of the total funding in 2023, which is expected as we align to the asset management plan. While the requirements of debt has been increasing as a result of the COVID-19 financial recovery plan and the results of the core asset management plan, it is still manageable and prudent forecasting oversight. As we align to the asset management plan, debt will play a critical role. This graph shows the debt servicing costs in the lower grade blocks, and then also shows the council imposed debt limit policy of 10% of our own source revenue in blue. Looking at the current forecast shows that the 2022 debt servicing ratio at 10.02%, which was approved last year to be above the 10% council limit, which, will, which we will be again recommending to be above this threshold in 2023. Due to the increase of the AMP requirements, the forecast debt serving ratio is expected to be around 14% in 2020, in 2027. Having said that, looking at the orange line, the city remains well within the provincial limit, better known as the annual payment limit, which is set at 25% of loan source revenue. The debt limits will change as actual results are incorporated into the ratios. In conservativeness, we estimate interest rates at 5% for this forecast. Uh, recent interest rates uh, are around 4% for 10-year debentures, which we confirmed with infrastructure on Ontario today. When looking at our municipal comparators with similar age infrastructure that were built in the 1800s, we are below the average debt levels. With a debt outstanding of 123 million compared to our average to our comparator average of 148 million. This is all consistent also consistent on a debt per capita level. This measure adjusts debt levels for comparability based off of population size. The city has a debt per capita of $864 compared to our comparator average of $944. Looking at our capital plans and related funding over the next five years is required by the Missile Act. Like the, um, the projects in the budget are forecast and aligned to support the corporate strategies and plans. The average capital budget over the next five years is $75 million. The core asset management plan requires $69 million at a minimum to maintain the existing level of service. The term core was defined uh, by the province to include linear assets such as roads, water, and wastewater networks. The second phase of the asset management plan will will include non-core assets, will likely increase the $69 million number and include, and the majority of that increase will be in our facilities and recreational assets. In conclusion, I wanna highlight the staff recommendations for council's consideration. So recommendation one, seven, and eight are consistent with previous capital budget appro approvals and are administrative in nature. The recommendations two, three, and six are related to the 2023 capital budget and specifically exceptions have been made related to the approved debt management strategy, including funding capacity. Uh, recommendation four creates operational capacity for the 2023 capital budget and recommendation five is for risk mitigation. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. That concludes staff's presentation on the 2023 capital budget and 24-27 forecasts. All right, thank you for the presentation. So at this point, we're going to close the public meeting. As I said, no written correspondence was received and no one requested to speak this evening. So I have a mover and a seconder to close the public meeting. Councillor Lindell, Councillor Kushner, all those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried and we are closing the public meeting. So we have a staff recommendation in the report. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the staff recommendation on the capital budget? Councillor Phillips, seconded by Councillor Townsend. All right, any questions or comments with respect to the staff recommendation? There are a number of amendments that were forwarded, so we will deal with those in good time, but I would like to deal with any questions or comments if there are any, first of all. Councillor Kushner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We've talked about uh, 
multiple year budgets and you've presented some information and that the capital expenditure would be constant for the next few years. Being constant and with their uh, revenues increasing from uh, increased taxation, what will that 14% amount to in four or five years? I will look to Ms. Douglas. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, um, based on our current uh, revenue uh, forecast, we have been uh, conservative in our revenue estimate. And uh, based on that, you're speaking with regards to the debt uh, ratio. Um, so with our forecasted revenues, our debt uh, ratio would be the uh, um, just over the, the 14%. Um, as Mr. Chung did indicate in um, the presentation, um, interest rates we have modeled based on um, a 5%. And as of um, today, Infrastructure Ontario for um, the um, five to 25 year debt, um, they're all at 4%. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I don't think I understand if the uh, capital cost is frozen for the next four or five years and our revenues, our tax revenues are increasing, why wouldn't that percentage come down? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to um, the councillor. Um, the, the reason why the percentage is, is not going down, we have put in our forecasting, we have put in an inflationary increase on, in our revenues in the, um, the future years. Thank you. All right, other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, we do have a number of amendments. Um, The first one, and I believe it's up, it's coming up on the screen, uh, is from Councillor Garcia, that the 2023 capital budget be increased by $12,000 funded by the infrastructure levy reserve to bring the number of self-watering hanging baskets from 17 to 34 in Port Dalhousie in alignment to the historical number of baskets supported in the program. This will have an operating impact as well, a small operating impact. Um, to increase the number of self-watering hanging baskets in Port Dalhousie. So we would also be referring that to the 2023 operating budget for consideration in January. So it would not be included in the operating budget that was tabled this evening, but it would be in a small additional cost. So Councillor Garcia, would you like to speak to this? It's fairly self-explanatory, but... Uh... Yes, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, just a couple of uh, quick comments. Uh, just to emphasize that we have always had at least 34 baskets uh, forever, as far as I can remember. And then it, <clears throat> the amount was reduced, I think, to zero during the, the worst of the pandemic because uh, so many things were cut back. And then when we came back, we ended up uh, uh, increasing it back to only 17. And at this same time, we were trying to change from the old style of baskets to self-watering baskets, which are... Um, more environmentally friendly, obviously, in that the truck doesn't have to go around so often to fill them and with diesel fumes and so on. And also, they, are, they have a life of about 10 years, which is the reason they're a capital expenditure. So I'm just asking that we return to what we used to have and to keep in mind that Port de Lucie is one of the main tourist areas of the city. We get thousands of visitors every year for regattas and other events. And as Councilman Phillips mentioned earlier, in terms of events, we have the 2024 Worlds coming up. So we're hoping that Council will support that. Thank you, Councilor Garcia. It is a small addition, but I think a worthwhile addition to the capital budget. Uh, Councilor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, my question would just be that I know that there were a number of self-watering baskets that were supposed to be, or directed to downtown. Is that going to impact? Is that would this impact downtown getting self basket? Okay. No, this is this is over and above. Perfect. And I think the move to I, I will give credit to the last council. The move to the self watering, more environmentally friendly baskets is a good one. And if we can move forward with that to do the beautification of both areas, I think that's a net positive. Uh, so seeing no other, oh, Councillor Stevens. Just one question through Mr. Mayor to finance probably. Is that is that number is that 
what we know 17 baskets would cost or like if you're only budgeting $12,000 and the price of baskets up, you can only get 12 baskets for that money, then we're only, you're only asking for that much money, you won't get your baskets? The, with the capital budget, the, the dollars that are put in or the dollars that are put in? Yes, but I, I think staff are very confident in those numbers, okay? All right, I will look to the clerk to call the roll. So this is just on the amendment. Councillor yes. Garcia. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Definitely, thank you. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Lindell. Yes. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Ratzlaff. Yes. Councillor Stevens. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. And Mayor Cisco. Yes. That's carried. And then there were a number of what amounted to directions to staff. Uh, Councillor Garcia had a number of what uh, could have been amendments, but staff have indicated they are directions. Uh, so I will just go through those quickly. The staff liaise with the Beautification and Works Committee in Port Luzi to identify and quantify power and other required upgrades and repairs beyond those that are already approved in the 2022 budget and that funds be allocated in the 2023 budget. Macefield stairs replacement that staff complete their waterfront access plan in Q1 of 2023 to ensure design work can be completed and work on the replacement stairs commenced by May 1st of 2023 and that other stairs to Lake Ontario that funds be allocated in the 2023 budget to cover anticipated costs of any structural deficiencies on existing stairs including the Graham Avenue stairs and that this work be completed prior to the busy summer season when stairs are in high demand and that was determined those were determined to be directions to staff as opposed to needed amendments and so directions to staff. So we will go back to the main motion. Uh, staff recommendation as amended with the additional piece. Uh, not seeing any questions, comments, or concerns. Uh, I will look to the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Stevens. Yes. Councillor Ratzlaff. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. And Mayor Cisco? Yes. And that's carried. All right, moving on to item 7.4, Economic Development and Tourism Services. Application for exemption to bylaw 95-212, Reptilia. Uh, notice of consideration of the application for exemption to bylaw 95-212, Reptilia has been published in accordance with the city's notice bylaw. The public meeting will proceed as follows. Members of the public were provided with options to submit written correspondence. Items received have been placed in council's sugar sink folder prior to the meeting. Members of the public wishing to delegate were advised to RSVP with the Office of the City Clerk by 9 a.m. today. Uh, we have a number of individuals who are registered to speak, some in person, some online. Uh, I believe at this we have 14, 17 uh, speakers. Uh, once they have finished speaking, the applicant will present. At that point, the public meeting will be closed and staff will then be able to respond to any questions and council will debate the motion. I will make one request to our presenters this evening. Uh, because we have a very long speakers list, 17 individuals will be speaking. I would simply ask that uh, we confine our comments as much as possible to new information. So uh, if you are coming and you are presenting the same information as previous speakers, I would ask that you try and do that as quickly as possible and try to avoid repeating information. Uh, I only ask that because these presentations are likely to go for quite a while. Uh, and to be able to maintain focus if we're not repeating the same things over and over again, that makes the process work a little bit better. So with that, the public meeting is now open, just because of him, and I will call upon Barry McKay to present first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and members of council, uh, fellow presenters. Uh, I think uh, most of you probably are well aware that there's a a UN biodiversity conference uh, taking place right now in Montreal. But what got a lot less uh, uh, press media attention was a conference that ended uh, just about a week and a half ago in Panama of the uh, conference of the uh, conference of the parties to the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, which we uh, know by the acronym CITES, C-I-T-E-S. And uh, it dealt with a uh, large number of, of uh, wildlife species and trade. 
And uh, while I have lots of credentials, I think uh, most appropriate perhaps is the uh, fact that I'm a founding member of the Species Survival Network, uh, about a 30 year old organization that uh, is a uh, international uh, nonprofit that deals exclusively with wildlife and trade. And what was exciting for me personally about uh, the meeting just held in Panama was that um, for the first time we, we had a large number of what we call herptiles on the uh, on the agenda. Herptiles is the collective term for reptiles and amphibians, and those and sharks uh, were uh, groups of animals that uh, we've been trying for years to get uh, to get onto the agenda, and we finally did. And we had success, uh, of which I was very pleased. Uh, and I, I, I find it ironic. I, it, it's complicated to go into what that success means. But the uh, bottom line is that both SSN and studies only deals with wildlife trade. And the big driver of, of international trade in herptiles, as it pertains to particularly to Canada and the US, is the exotic pet trade. And uh, th these species are going down the tubes uh, dramatically, which brings us to the other conference, the one now in place in Montreal, where we, we learn how many uh, uh, species of wildlife are, are in decline. And I only bring this up not because I think it's a responsibility of, of uh, St. Catherine's Council to worry about international conservation concerns so much as to try to uh, plead with you to understand that Reptilia is not a conservation organization, nor is it a sanctuary. I also worked for 20 years for Adam Roberts, who just recently passed away, who was a co-founder of GFAST, the, uh, the uh, organization that accredits uh, wildlife sanctuaries. And there's no way uh, that, that uh, Reptilia would match the criteria that GFAST has um, the, the Global Association of uh, Animal Sanctuaries is, is the acronym. Um, it's, it's, it's a storefront zoo, and it's a profit-driven uh, organization. Uh, yes, they have a, a, a good spiel. I've heard it, whereby they say, you know, don't, don't keep these reptiles, and then they sort of encourage you to, uh, oh, by the way, we sell all the everything you need to uh, house these uh, animals on the way out. And of course, when people go tire them and, and discard them, uh, Reptilia is there to pick up uh, uh, free specimens of, of certain species. Now, that's harshly put, and I apologize that time is very limited, and I want to be very very quick and brief, but the fact of the matter is, this is not what a sanctuary is about. A sanctuary is a nonprofit organization, not open to the public, doesn't uh, promote the selling, doesn't sell <laughs> accoutrements or anything else, nor is it really much of a zoo when you look at real zoos like the Toronto Zoo, which do have conservation and educational components built into them. Uh, Reptilia is, is, is a, uh, a, a for-profit storefront zoo and mobile live animal uh, uh, program that uh, makes money out of reptiles and amphibians. That may be fine. That that, that you may agree. Okay, we're, we're we're good with that. That's not for me to say. But I just want to disabuse this notion that it is in some way a conservation organization or an animal sanctuary. It really isn't. And uh, with that, uh, go ice dogs, and I will uh, answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Mr. McKay, I will give you credit for working in the go ice dogs at the end. And I will also say you kept under the five minute limit and I do sincerely appreciate that. Uh, any questions, any questions or comments from council to Mr. McKay? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. McKay. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, Michelle Hammers to present. slide show that if it can be pulled up that would be great yes so while that's happening i'll start to keep your uh to keep it short so my name is michelle hammers i'm here on behalf of world animal protection we are the largest international animal protection organization in canada with more than 160,000 supporters in ontario we are evidence-based um, and we work with projects like with governments and businesses to find practical um, um, uh, 
um, long-lasting solutions to animal welfare issues. Um, myself, uh, I have a degree in animal welfare and biology at Essex University in the UK, a member of the Royal Society of Biology, um, and a designated European professional biologist. I'm one of the few people that has done extensive research into captive wildlife issues here in Canada. Um, so, next slide, please. A little bit about reptile welfare, because I think when we talk about, you know, uh, places that have monkeys or elephants, we are kind of, uh, uh, we tend to scrutinize them a bit more. And reptiles, they're kind of, we kind of forget them often when it comes to legislations or by, uh, you know, providing somebody with an exemption to a bylaw, for example. So what about reptile welfare? So when we talk about welfare, we talk about the physical, mental and social state of a reptile. Um, and that determines its welfare and overall quality of life. So for good welfare to be achieved, they need to be able to perform natural behaviors, uh, engage in the full range of natural uh, movements, um, being able to make choices. Um, and as you can see in the next slide, reptiles live in very highly complex environments, um, very spacious, flexible environments, changing weather patterns, etc. Um, but then if we go um, um, look at reptilia, I've been to reptilia many times at the other locations. Next slide, please. We see what can happen when the animal welfare is not being met. And there is a little video that I would like to show you. Hopefully it works. It will be the, the video on, on the right side. Yeah. So the behavior of what you're seeing here is called um, ITB or Interaction with Transparent Boundaries. Reptiles um, do not understand the concept of glass or any transparent boundaries, and they will try over and over again to go through it because they can, don't understand that it's a barrier. This can result in abrasions to the nose and, and, the, and the, uh, the digits, um, and is overall very problematic, and we can see this in many zoos, and this is a video that was taken at Reptilia. Um, and this happens when, you know, when the welfare of, of, of an animal isn't met. And just to describe this, um, last December, December, yeah, last year, the city of Toronto actually turned down Reptilia's request for an exemption to their animal control bylaw. Um, and during this consideration of that request, a comprehensive review of Reptilia, Reptilia was conducted by the city of Toronto staff. And their report highlighted several issues including information obtained from uh, several 2020 provincial animal wealth services inspection documents um, of the two reptilia locations. And these documents showed a number of concerns, including animals that didn't have drinking water, staff that wasn't able to locate vet records, um, enclosures that weren't clean, the water in which the crocodile live wasn't changed for quite a while, five exhibits without working lights, um, animals that retain their shed, and this happens because humidity and temperature aren't well controlled within the enclosure. Um, discrepancies in feed rotation, so animals not being fed enough. Um, five animals with concerning body conditions were detected, um, so much that the order was made up, to, uh, was made out to uh, ensure that these animals would see a vet, as well as more than 30 animals that were moved to another location in the River Reptile Zoo um, um, for these animals to, to be rescued. Um, so these findings are very basic, simple husbandry requirements that haven't been met. And I'll just show you some of the other enclosures. I have a couple more slides that are ready. Um, so this is a crocodile uh, exhibit. Um, crocodiles are highly social animals, actually, that live in very complex uh, environments. Uh, um, they live off um, in the water and, and on land. Um, um, but as you can see here, um, th th honestly, the enclosures are, are rudimentary. Um, they are concrete pits that actually really make me think of zoos back in the 60s and 70s, where this type of of uh, exhibition of animals was um, was allowed and encouraged. Um, these animals have no privacy. They have no real space to swim or, or um, um, engage in any natural behaviors. Next slide, please. And these are just some other pictures. Uh, some of the enclosures where animals can even stretch their bodies. Um, on the left side, you see the, an enclosure of the tortoises. Uh, tortoises are uh, far-ranging animals that, that can cover many miles in a day or in a week. 
Um, and again, like there, there's just no evidence that there is, or there's little evidence that, that you know, the, the animal welfare is safeguarded for these animals. Ms. And then Hammer, just to, if I could just ask you to sum up. Yes, yes. Um, and just a last point I wanted to make um, um, about this, as, as the previous speaker also mentioned, um, there is no zoo in Canada that sells animal uh, products when you walk through their store. So if you go to Toronto Zoo, you can pick up monkey chow for your pet monkey. They say they are promoters of the exotic pet trade. So besides having a, a, a facility, uh, um, I'm, I'm concerned that the, that, the, uh, that the city will face many more uh, people that will keep these animals and then have to get uh, dispose of them because they are very difficult to keep. And I'll keep it at that. And the, Apologies for going over time. That's okay. I appreciate your comments. Are there any questions? All right. Seeing none, thank you for the presentation. I'll now call upon Scott Tinney to present. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so just to introduce myself, my name is Scott Tinney, and I'm a staff lawyer with Animal Justice, a national animal law advocacy group focused on preventing cruelty to animals through, among other things, the enforcement of existing municipal, provincial, and federal laws. Our organization is located in Toronto, Ontario, and many of our thousands of supporters are closely monitoring St. Catherine's decision in this matter. So as such, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Council for giving me the time to speak on such an important issue and for taking the time to consider our position on the proposed exemption for reptilia to the city of St. Catherine by law 95212. Um, so it is animal justice position that the city should not amend its bylaw in a way that would allow reptilia to keep prohibited animals, nor should it grant an exemption to reptilia to use exotic animals for offsite activities such as mobile live zoo programs. There are a variety of reasons why we believe that this uh, exception would not be beneficial for the city, uh, many of which I'm sure will be outlined by the several speakers uh, following me, um, including uh, for public health and safety reasons and for animal welfare concerns. Uh, but I'm going to focus on a few more uh, technical uh, points, uh, which I'll go through in a turn. So first, uh, amending the current bylaw for reptilia risks opening a door uh, that cannot be closed in St. Catherine. Uh, more specifically, if the city is to allow reptilia to possess and display a variety of exotic species and to keep these animals for off-site programs, it would be extremely difficult to come back and restrict this facility in the future if there are any problems or if reptilia seeks to expand beyond its current scope. For example, if the proposed amendment is granted and Reptilia chooses to expand their facility to incorporate new dangerous animals into their display or their offsite programs, including who knows, big cats, monkeys, or any, any number of other exotic animals, the city may be left without any option but to allow for the growth of the facility based on its previous decision to grant the amendment. The reality is that Reptilia is a for-profit business and they will continue to operate in a manner that prioritizes making money over the welfare of the animals that they keep. This poses a significant problem for the city if an amendment is granted. This stands in stark contrast, as previous speakers mentioned, to well-established AZA-accredited accredited facilities like the Toronto Zoo, for example, who have clear plans for their facility and a direction to move towards. Established facilities like the Toronto Zoo, while they still have their own problems, accept responsibility for animal care and animal enrichment, and have a number of individuals and groups who they routinely consult with in crafting future plans. These controls are not in place to the same extent at a facility like Reptilia. As such, introducing a broad amendment in favor of this facility in the short term could lead to significant repercussions in the long term. The second point that I'd like to raise is the fact that the proposed reptilia amendments um, it, in the city stand against the current federal push for heightened exotic animal regulations across Canada in the form of Bill S-241 or the Jane Goodall Act. The Jane Goodall Act, which is currently being debated at Senate, would, be, would amend the criminal code as well as other federal laws to regulate the keeping and showcasing of exotic animals across the country. Relevantly to our discussion here today, the changes in the Jane Goodall Act would set groundbreaking new standards across Canada by phasing out the importing, keeping, and breeding of hundreds of species of wild animals in Canada, including numerous reptiles like croctiles, crocodiles, certain large lizards, and several snakes. The Jane Goodall Act is designed to address the current lack of regulation at roadside zoo operations like Reptilia in the interest of protecting the health and welfare of countless animals, as well as protecting public health and safety. The Jane Goodall Act has received ample support from zoos, including the Toronto Zoo, Calgary Zoo, the Granby Zoo, the Montreal Biodome, and the Assiniboine Park Zoo, as well as leading Canadian animal advocacy organizations, and appears to be on track to become law in Canada. By granting reptilian an exemption, the City of St. Catherine could be moving in a direction opposite that of the Canadian government at this time. With that said, the City should not take a wait-and-see approach with this federal initiative. The reality is that circumstances can change quickly in federal politics, and we might not have this national protection on the books to protect animals, or it may take years to pass. St. Catharines should be actively ensuring that it is not allowing potentially dangerous businesses to operate in the interim. 
Uh, one final item I just quickly want to uh, address before I wrap up, um, and this is probably going to be discussed um, significantly throughout the, throughout our delegation today, so I won't go into too much detail. It's that by granting this uh, exemption, we're also bringing with it, with it a host of animal welfare issues and public health and safety issues. I strongly encourage council members to review the Toronto Economic Development Committee's report recommending against granting reptilia an exemption in the city of Toronto, which I believe is included or at the very least um, repeatedly referenced in the agenda for today uh, before making a decision on this matter. Uh, so thank you once again for taking the time to consider my submissions. That's all I've got to say, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Tinney. Any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for the presentation. We'll now move to Dr. Clifford Warwick to present. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, councillors and staff. I'm Dr. Clifford Warwick. Um, I assume you can uh, hear me fine. Uh, I qualified in medicine um, and science uh, with a degree that was advanced in specialised uh, diseases and, uh, and basically uh, relates to those uh, infections and transmissible conditions between uh, animals and people uh, and the associated risks to go with them. Uh, I also have a doctorate in reptile welfare science, along with four additional advanced postgraduate qualifications in reptile biology. I have uh, produced over 150 peer-reviewed scientific publications in reptile biology and welfare, including editing the world's two definitive scientific reference volumes on the subject, and I also have produced about 50 peer-reviewed publications in human medicine, uh, zoonotic infection risk and public health and safety relating to captive wild animals. Much of my work involves the research, development and publication of scientific protocols, processing reptile welfare, protecting public health and safety, and the preparation of advanced guidance for both governments and facility inspectors involving zoos, pet stores and interactive animal experiences. I'm also a regular independent consultant to and contractee for governments globally on all of the aforementioned issues. I've also conducted numerous training workshops with the Ontario SPCA, Canadian enforcement officials, policy-making staff, veterinarians and others across Canada. Of note, uh, numerous colleagues and I have recently completed a major independent scientific, veterinary and medical investigation and report on mobile live animal programs, which is at the moment pending publication in a leading science journal and we expect this to be published within the next few weeks. My recommendation is that the City Council denies a site-specific exemption for Reptilia Zoo with particular concerns regarding any mobile live animal programs. As part of my duties, I have visited a major Reptilia site with the SPCA during my investigation of uh, Reptilia's operations. I noticed numerous significant issues of concern on both public health and safety and animal welfare fronts. These are persistent problems. For example, uh, miseducation that understates infection risk to the public, miseducation on reptile handling, lack of staff knowledge regarding disease transmission processes, numerous examples of stress-related behaviours among the reptiles, notably the larger animals. Michelle Hamer's touched on some of these, and I support everything she said. Uh, low awareness among staff regarding signs of stress in reptiles. Those are not creditable things for an institution. Modern science has demonstrated that reptiles have physiological, cognitive and behavioural needs that are far greater than we previously thought. Indeed, often those, uh, those uh, abilities would exceed the, uh, con the uh, similar kinds of uh, situations in birds and mammals. And um, basically this means that it's, it's at least as hard to try and accommodate these animals and prevent stress as, uh, as it is for birds and mammals and other what we think of as complex individuals. And this is why we see so many cases of stress in reptilia's animals. I've noticed certain statements uh, by reptilia that are, I think, likely intended to convince the council that their operation presents no uh, particular uh, risk to public health because, for example, they claim that there are no cases of disease that have emerged from reptilia. However, it is actually uh, well known in epidemiology that there are commonly transmissible, uh, common um, essentially transmission lag phases, as we call them, lag phases, between when one is exposed to an infectious source at an operation such as reptilia and the onset of the human disease that follows. Thus, people and their doctors often don't make the connection that they've been infected at an event like reptilia. Reptiles carry, in fact, something like 40 human infections. And for just one of these, salmonella infection, reptiles cause between... Uh, 
an additional 5 to 17 percent on top of the normal cases of salmonella across all sources. And a rather staggering uh, statistic is that 27 percent of hospitalized young children with salmonella infections catch it just from reptiles. Uh, even indirect contact with uh, reptile salmonella contaminated uh, handrails, for instance, at a zoo has called over th caused over 300 infections and mobile live animal programs are far higher risk. Importantly, major concern is now being voiced by the international veterinary, scientific and public health and safety communities that expressly states that especially off-site interactions between people and animals should not be permitted because safe regulation is effectively impossible. And it's my firm view that Reptilia is not a suitable facility for St. Catharines. I hope that the Council will um, treat Reptilia's claims with appropriate uh, scepticism uh, and approach it with uh, a due caution uh, and act in accordance with the previous uh, Council decisions and reject Reptilia's application in order to prevent significant future problems. If I can answer any questions, just please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Warwick. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. I will now call upon Miles Howe to present. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm a professor of sociology up at Brock University, uh, new to the St. Catharines area. Um, just in, in hearing this city council meeting, I've been very excited about a bunch of the great initiatives coming to this city. Um, and while public health and safety of the animals and people who may well visit a facility such as Reptilia are of paramount importance, I think the city and the municipal staff can also recognize that <clears throat> this may not be the type of uh, public relations fiasco in waiting that uh, anybody here wants to get behind. Um, we've seen some great initiatives coming up here in terms of uh, hockey tournaments, wonderful uh, possibilities of bringing, uh, you know, tourism dollars to the city. And I just want to echo that I don't think that Reptilia is is one of these instances where where um, this is going to be at all a, a positive spin on on a venture that that doesn't need to come here. This is a uh, a throwback. Um, we've we've come leaps and bounds in understanding animal cognition, the needs of animals over the last number of decades. And um, <clears throat> quite bluntly, this is not the 1950s anymore. We don't need a facility like this. We don't need to be amping up uh, the, the perception that St. Catharines might become some kind of hub for the exotic animal trade. And um, I look forward to spending uh, many years in this wonderful town. And um, I just reiterate and echo the, the sentiments of the experts who have come before me that this is not the type of um, facility that needs to be in this town. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. La uh, Mr. Howe, and I uh, appreciate uh, you uh, moving very quickly through your comments. Uh, any questions or comments for Mr. Howe? Seeing none, thank you again for the presentation. I'll now call upon Sheila Krikorian to present. Uh, Ms. Krikorian, you're here in person. If you just want to head over to the microphone on the end of the, uh, the bench here. Our setup has changed slightly uh, since we started live streaming, and so what used to be the front lectern is actually now the camera bench. So <laughs> this is where public comment comes from. So Ms. Krikorian, feel free to begin. Hi everyone, my name is Sheila Krikorian. I have lived my entire life in St. Catharines up till two weeks ago where I moved to Niagara Falls. However, my family, my friends, my place of work is here in St. Catharines. I'm a registered nurse and I was astounded to hear that Reptilia was coming back for the fourth time trying to set up shop here in St. Catharines and I believe it's at the Fairview Mall. Um, my understanding for this to happen is Council has to provide an exemption to the St. Catharines Bylaw 95212, which I understood in 2013 was updated and it was augmenting the modernization and prohibiting the types of dangerous animals that Reptilia wants to peddle to the people in the community. Yes, they're going to tell you we're going to do lots of things to keep things safe here, but if we don't have the animals here, then there is no risk to safety if they're not here. I looked up this bylaw to try to figure out how did this come in place in 2013? Why was it updated? 
And I was remembering the news reports back from 2013 about two children in Canada who were killed by a giant snake that escaped. They were in an apartment above a pet store. The kids were sleeping, age four and six, and they were sleeping, strangled during the night by the huge snake. They had lots of strike marks on them. I got this information from reading news reports and there's lots of information in there that I would like to forget because it was horrifying. But do, what I do remember is the kids were four and six and their names were Connor and Noah. So I understand that we have this exemption here in St. Catharines because of that instance. And I can't believe in this day and age we'd think to repeal it for the benefit of a business reptilia. So my ask is that you do not allow any exemption or repealing of this bylaw because we need it here in St. Catharines. Um, I just wanted to say too, in my personal and professional life, I get to speak to a lot of people about animal issues, animal welfare issues, where the world is going because of COVID and that type of thing. And people are looking for a more kinder, gentler place. We're looking for um, more animal awareness, kindness, and people are concerned about animal welfare issues. And we can see that with demonstrations at marine land, repealing horse-drawn carriage rides, that type of thing. People's shifts are changing, not only locally, but globally. And I remember recently, I was very happy when city council put an end to the circus that was coming to town. I think that was back in 2019. As a registered nurse, however, I feel it's just preposterous to think that we would have a reptilia business come into our town while we're still within the COVID pandemic. We know that the disease of COVID did not arise from a lab. We know that it happened because there's animals in wet markets, which were under a, a lot of stress, were kept in proximity with other animals. And the COVID, the coronavirus was able to transmit from the animals to humans. So while we're still in this pandemic, while our kids are still in the hospital fighting RSV, why would we invite more reptiles into our town? It seems preposterous to me. Um, I wonder too, when people do get these pets, if they grow tired of them, if they get too big, if they get aggressive, what are they going to do with them? Are they going to give them to Kevin at the Humane Society, drop them off at the door? Or they're going to think, well, I'll be kind. I'll let them go out in the parks or waterways or something like that. And then what happens? That's similar to what's happened in Florida. And once they have invasive species, you cannot get rid of them. And I think reptilia is going to be like that too. Once you open the door and let them in, we are never going to get them out. So my ask of council is that you do not allow reptilia an exemption. And I hope I kept it to the five minutes. You did, Ms. Gregorian. Thank you very much for that. Uh, are there any questions or comments for the presenter? All right, seeing none, thank you, Ms. Gregorian, for your presentation. I'll now call upon, call upon Elizabeth Smith to present. Ms. Smith, if you want to head over to the mic. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Siskel and Council Members, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm a resident of St. Catharines. I've lived here for 30 years. This proposed change to our captive animal bylaw is imbued with numerous issues, and as a member of this community, I hope to relate to some of the concerns that I have. As I'm sure you're all well aware, public opinion on keeping wild animals in captivity for entertainment purposes has vastly shifted in recent years. One need not look far in our own community to see the overwhelming public disdain for another local and infamous captive animal facility, Marine Land, where wild animals live in unnatural, tiny enclosures and suffer from very poor welfare standards. Heightened public awareness on the realities behind closed doors of zoos and aquariums, things like wild capture, captive breeding programs, the international exotic pet trade, and inadequate living conditions for animals makes it difficult for businesses like Reptilia to escape public scrutiny. However, in their bid to appeal to the good senses of you council members, Reptilia has sought to shift focus away from the commercial nature of their business and instead try to convince you and other concerned members of the public that the primary tenet of their business model is to rescue discarded animals and educate the public on reptiles. While the latter rationale may be perceived as noble in theory, a more critical understanding of the industry could see through this very thin veil. 
The business model that Reptilia operates under is problematic not only from an animal welfare perspective, but of course a public health perspective. Upon looking at the corporate report on the economic development and tourism services, Reptilia claims legitimacy having recently received accreditation from the Canadian Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or CASA. However, CASA is not a government oversight body, but rather a private charitable organization that is primarily self-regulated by its own paying members. And of course, this certainly raises questions the extent to which the conclusions drawn from their investigations on animal welfare and public safety are impartial and reliable. Furthermore, the investigations conducted by CASA are only done once every five years. They do not follow methodical standards and do not monitor Reptilia's off-site activities, which of course encompasses a significant part of their business model. This would leave our city with the significant responsibility of managing the potential public safety risks of transporting exo exotic reptiles to various off-site functions around the city, in essence, shouldering the burden for rep regulating what CASA does not. Reptiles in captive zoos live in, at best, rudimentary environments that, no matter how well-intentioned, can never match the complex environments of their natural habitats. Even more unfortunate for the reptiles that have to be trucked to off-site birthday parties, exhibits, the lack of space from being transported in small containers can lead to physical deterioration and abnormal behavioral issues like circling, bar biting, and hyperaggression with their handlers. Further, the corporate report acknowledges Reptilia's interest in establishing a flagship tourist attraction in St. Catharines. It seems to me a rather flimsy justification to discard our progressive legislation on animal welfare, merely to bring a commercial zoo into a mall and pretend that this constitutes a solid tourism strategy in the year 2022. Like Marineland, Reptilia is clasping onto a dying business model and hoping that the public is naive enough to think that they're, not, that they're in it for noble reasons. Reptilia may claim that they exist to rescue animals, but it is a commercial enterprise like Reptilia, uh, premised on putting animals' bodies on display for entertainment, that creates the societal demand for more reptile breeding, further perpetuating the exotic pet trade and creating the conditions where reptiles are poorly managed and ultimately discarded by ignorant pet owners. Ironically, these very problems that they are complicit in creating are also the things that Reptilia markets themselves as fighting against. Please don't be fooled. St. Catharines is a progressive city. Mayor and council made the admirable decision to ban traveling animal circuses on city property in 2019, and it would be very disappointing and backwards move to subsequently welcome both a permanent and a traveling reptile zoo to operate on our city just three years later. If you grant this exemption, it will certainly open the door for even more requests by other captive animal facilities to operate in our city and nearby region, thereby certainly making the existence of this bylaw completely futile. We need to continue to be a respectable example for other municipalities, one that endorses a humane tourism strategy that is innovative, safe, and does not tacitly rely on the breeding of captive wild animals to entertain us. I sincerely hope that you will follow in the footsteps of Toronto City Council by denying Reptilia their request to amend this bylaw 95212. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Are there any questions for the presenter? Councillor Miller. Hi, thank you, Ms. Smith. Through you, the mayor. Do you know, was Marineland credited, accredited through CAS at one point? Yes, it was. Okay. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Uh, I will now call upon Roon Smith to present. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rune Smith. I'm a resident of St. Catharines, and I have been for 30 years. Since you will be uh, are hearing from many others, I will only focus on uh, just a few points here. First point, exotic wild animals in captivity are not regulated in Ontario. Currently, there are 70 mobile zoos and exotic animal businesses in Ontario that no doubt would love to set up in St. Catharines or the region if precedence will be set by allowing the exemption for the current bylaw. Thirdly, there are some obvious concerns both to public health and safety as well as animal welfare. Exotic animals can carry zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that transmit from animal to humans. Uh, an example is rabies. They, uh, they can come from viruses, bacteria, parasites and such. And because reptilia allows the public, including kids, to touch and handle these animals, diseases could get spread to people. 
Welfare concerns come from the stress to the animals from being in unnatural environments, as you've heard, unable to move or behave normally, and from be being transported in small cages and boxes to shows, and from being handled by the viewing public, including children. Animal welfare groups and experts have serious concerns about this, as you've heard. Animal rights perspective would tell us that wild animals should have the right to belong in and be left in the wild. Wild animals should also ethically and morally have the right to not be bred in captivity. That would include for the purpose of keeping them on display or selling them to the public as exotic pets, both of which is regret regrettably still being done to make profits for enterprises like Reptilia and the exotic pet trade. Last but not least, please consider that in the 21st century, in the last decade in particular, public opinion and consciousness has changed and keeps changing toward moving away from holding animals captive, particularly for people's entertainment. If you allow Reptilia to set up in St. Catharines, it will teach kids and the coming generations that number one, displaying exotic animals and using them as our entertainment is acceptable, normal, and desirable. And thus, the cycle of use, breeding, or capturing wild animals will continue. Secondly, it will encourage the exotic pet trade and thus perpetuate the lucrative, cruel, dangerous, and upsetting exotic animal trade. Both of these are bad and backwards lessons for our youth. As a senior citizen, I'm concerned about our youth and I feel we need to be setting good and ethical examples for them to learn. In December of 2021, after an exhaustive investigation by Toronto Animal Services, both Toronto City Council and Economic and, and Committee Development and Community Development Committee unanimously voted to deny Reptilia an example. I am optimistic that you, St. Catherine City Council members, will do what Toronto did, make the ethical decision that favors the animal's welfare and the public's health by voting against making an exemption to the existing bylaw. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Are there any questions for the presenter? Seeing none, thank you for the presentation. I'll now call upon Lynn Michaud to present. We think that possibly Lynn has left the call. Okay, we will circle back before we finish up with the public portion of this meeting. And we think the same for the next speaker as well. Okay, Julie um, Woodyer? Correct, so if Ju Julie Woodyer is online, if she could let us know, but we think she's left. Okay, then I will move on to Catherine Sussman to present. Hello, good evening everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I appreciate that everybody's been doing a lot of thinking. <laughs> so I uh, will try to keep it simple. Um, I'm an independent consultant and I have written an academic paper looking into the educational value of private zoos such as Reptilia as well as mobile live animal programs. And the object of my paper was to assist in determining whether or not the educational claims of these kinds of businesses are supported by evidence. The short answer is they're not. What I found is that almost none of the criteria that allow for learning in traditional zoos are possible with these kinds of businesses. The main criteria that allow for learning in traditional zoos are naturalistic free range exhibits, such as Ms. Hamers was descri describing while well, being in nature, um, and the ability of animals to display natural behaviors in their exhibits, enrichment presentations, signage or graphics, and reinforcement of a conservation, a conservation message. Private businesses such as Reptilia fail to meet all of these criteria, and let me just break this down why for you. The animals that are used are displayed out of their natural environments. The animals are not allowed free range, but are confined in small display exhibits. And when they are allowed out of their containers, it's to be used as fun objects, such as when a snake is wrapped over a participant's shoulders or around a child's waist. And 
while some programs do present signage or graphics, these displays are almost always minimal and they're often inaccurate. The information they do provide can actually be found readily without the use of live animals present. These programs are usually one-time presentations and the opportunity for reinforcement is really important for educational um, benefit and that just doesn't usually exist with one-off visits to places like this. In addition, live animals, the research, the research shows that they serve as a significant distraction rather than as a learning tool. Presentations and displays, um, display areas are often very loud and chaotic. And in fact, there are lots of studies that show that learning is most effective without the live animals present. Another finding in my research was that animals that typically get the most positive and enthusiastic reactions from participants are prioritized for display. So that colorful, active and large animals are more often learned about. This, the display is therefore driven by what is popular rather than by a coherent educational purpose. Guests of these businesses are more likely to respond to wild animals as domesticated. This contributes to the appeal of wild animals as pets and often leads to the desire to own an exotic animal, propagating the appeal and potential growth of the exotic pet trade. So even if reptilia's animals are rescues or born in captivity, displaying them in this way still does contribute to the exotic pet trade. Businesses like Re Reptilia also do not have a discernible conservation action plan. The lack of a conservation action plan results in them being extremely unlikely to produce any kind of measurable learning outcome. There is just not evidence that these programs result in conservation ac um, action. It just takes one glance at their website as well to see the lack of education or conservation efforts. I encourage you to go to the website and see the lack of any evidence of that. It must be be emphasized that learning from businesses like reptilia is had at the expense of the animals because they are non-consenting and captive. This contributes to negative learning that it is okay to discount the interests of animals themselves. It's really crucial to consider that conservation teaching with the use of captive animals normalizes captivity and is inherently contradictory. Being taught not to take animals from where they live, yet seeing animals who have been removed from their habitat or that exist outside of it and are no longer in the wild underscores a hypocrisy that sends the message that our amusement or even knowledge is justified at the expense of the animals. The concept of animal ambassadorship, which they have right on their website, um, it, it is just extremely suspect. Animals that are forced to sacrifice their freedom and privacy for their wild counterparts is just a terrible educational it's a, it's a miseducational or negative educational message to be sending children. My research has led me to the conclusion that making large unsubstantiated claims about positive educational value is educationally irresponsible and negatively impacts the public's perception and most crucially children's perception about other species and the environment. Learning that contributes to an attitude of unnecessary human use of animals and the objectification and exploitation of them is harmful. And based on, on this, I do not recommend any programs be given special exemption. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sussman. Are there any questions for the presenter? Councillor Miller. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Ms. Sussman. Just curious, on the Reptilia website, they list a number of school boards, presumably, that they've partnered with or had events with. Um, why do you think the school boards are working with them? Just you seem to have some insight into the education aspect. I think that they're well-meaning, but I think uh, there's a limit to how detailed the school boards can be or the specific teachers that are uh, looking into having these sorts of businesses come into the school. I think there's a limit to how much they know. So I think they're well-meaning, but unfortunately misguided. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Ms. Sussman, for the presentation. I'll now call upon Debbie Zimmerman to present. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I am De Dr. Debbie Zimmerman. I have a bachelor's degree in zoology and a doctorate in veterinary medicine. After 30 years of clinical veterinary practice, I now consult on captive animal welfare issues. 
Prior to vet school, I owned a variety of reptiles and worked in a pet store handling numerous reptile species, including non-venomous snakes. This experience led me to being one of the few veterinarians in my city who treated snakes and other reptiles. Today, I wish to address the risks to human health posed by the many species of lethally venomous snakes that reptilia may display if allowed to set up in your city. Accidental snake bites are always a risk when handling any snake, even at the hands of the most experienced handlers. Not only can venomous snakes inject their venom through a bite, many cobras and some vipers can accurately spit venom up to two meters or 6.6 .6 feet through a screened cage top, which can lead to permanent blindness. Snakes are extremely agile and can strike or spit without warning. And some snakes can be more irritable and apt to strike when hungry, not feeling well, or in a shedding cycle. Snakes are also exceptional escape artists and can often get out of seemingly secure containment facilities. And of course, human error can accentuate the risks of a bite or an escape. I should add that while I was working at the pet store in my younger years in a mall, our staff did incur snake bites, again, non-venomous, and we had at least three snake escapes with one found weeks later in a basement storage room. Consider scenarios if their black mamba were to escape. Just two drops of its venom can kill a man and it can travel 12 miles an hour. Note that even men who can run a six minute mile still only run at 10 miles an hour. There may be 100 plus individual toxic components in the venom of a single snake, making treatment a nightmare for physicians. These include neurotoxins, which cause rapid painful muscle contractions and or paralysis, especially the muscles of respiration, causing suffocation, hemotoxins, causing victims to bleed to death from uncontrolled hemorrhages from every orifice and in every organ, or massive blood clotting leading to stroke or organ failure. Cytotoxins, which trigger extreme swelling and tissue destruction to the point where tissue on a limb dries and rots off, similar to wet gangrene. Antivenoms are the only effective antidote for snake venom, and they're not cheap. Prices range from several hundred to tens of thousands of dollars per vial and are only a fraction of the overall costs of an emergency treatment and hospitalization, which for moderate to severe cases can easily run up to $100,000 or more, according to US statistics. Treatment requires five to 20 vials initially, followed by an additional five to 10 vials given until the symptoms abate. In extreme cases, up to 100 vials of antivenom were required. Venomous snake bites are a medical emergency. Treating a snake bite doesn't mean simply grabbing some antivenom out of the fridge, making a quick trip to the hospital, getting a shot, and then going home. Victims of moderate to severe envenomation must be hospitalized, as antivenom is given intravenously, and victims may require life support such as assisted ventilation and kidney dialysis until the severely damaged organs and tissues have had time to recover. Most emergency room physicians are not familiar with antivenoms and exotic snake bite treatment protocols. And hospitals in Canada do not stock exotic snake antivenoms. A small number of Canadian facilities stock antivenom for the exotic snakes that they keep, but other antivenoms have to be sourced from the US when needed which can significantly delay treatment to the point of being too late. Even with antivenom, there are no guarantees. Approximately one in five patients treated with antivenom can develop mild to life-threatening anaphylactic shock from an adverse reaction to the serum itself. And some bite survivors might still suffer permanent tissue or nerve damage, disfigurement and or amputations and permanent disabilities despite receiving the proper antivenom treatment. In closing, I want to say that purposely allowing venomous snakes into your community poses a real risk of a possible maiming or death of a handler or first responder in the case of a fire or flood or a member of the public in case of an escape, an additional unnecessary cost to the city and the healthcare system. The best way to keep everyone safe from venomous snakes is not to allow them in your city in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. Uh, are there any questions or comments 
All right, seeing none, thank you for the presentation. We'll now call upon Terry Letterman to present. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Terry Ladevin. I am the Vice President of Leasing for First Capital, the owner of Fairview Mall. Uh, I head up a team of approximately 15 highly skilled and passionate leasing prof professionals who take great care and employ remarkable innovation in identifying the best tenants to occupy our retail spaces. First Capital is an owner, operator, and developer of approximately $10 billion in total assets in 145 Canadian neighbourhoods. First Capital is in the business of creating thriving neighborhoods to generate value for businesses, residents and communities. Excuse me. As you're aware, Fairview Mall is a strong regional mall in St. Catharines and has been a social hub in this community since 1961. Our commitment is to ensure that we continue this tradition and help to create a thriving neighborhood and environment for families, businesses, tourists and all other stakeholders to prosper. We have already invested over $15 million at Fairview Mall towards this intent by adding many new tenants and the releasing of the former Walmart. There have been challenges for quite some time as it relates to the future of the enclosed retail shopping mall experience, with more and more shoppers electing to use omni-channel shopping as an alternative. Even prior to the pandemic, we've seen the demise of many large anchor tenants such as Target, Sears, Zellers, for example that we're not able to adapt effectively to changes to consumer shopping trends. Anchor tenants typically draw significant foot traffic to a mall and ultimately those consumers often visit other retailers during their visit. The current global pandemic further and quite severely impacted this enclosed mall environment. As a result, owners of enclosed regional malls have been challenged for many years in trying to determine the future of the enclosed shopping mall experience. Owners and retailers are continuing to adapt reinvent and create more experiential and social reasons for customers to physically visit their stores. Across North America, many mall owners are looking to add uses that cater to everyday physical needs, food and beverage, daycare, fitness, medical uses, and entertainment. These types of experiences cannot be accomplished online and therefore bring the community together to create a thriving social environment. Since many retailers are considering changing how they operate and are moving away from the enclosed mall and considering outdoor shopping centers or insisting on exterior access only, it's becoming extremely challenging for leasing teams to attract new retailers to the enclosed shopping center. To create a thriving environment, there must be many physical and social elements at play, such as entertainment, culinary experiences, arts, education, interaction, for example. Reptilia is one such use that we believe will be a draw for the shopping centre, the community and tourists in search of an educational, social, exciting and family experience. Bringing more people and increasing the foot traffic to Fairview Mall will also benefit our other retailers. It is our belief that Reptilia fits well into this future of retail and we believe will continue to help us to improve the retail offering at Fairview Mall and ultimately contribute to this thriving community social hub within the city of St. Catharines. First Capital requests that the mayor and councillors vote in favour of amending the bylaw to allow Reptilia to operate at Fairview Mall. Um, subject to any questions um, from the mayor or councillors, um, those are First Capital's respectful submissions. Thank you, Mr. Letterman. Are there any questions or comments? <laughs> Councillor Miller? Yeah, just a question. Do you know um, if operating or uh, having a tenant like this would change your uh, liability or insurance requirements or anything like that? Uh, typically, it would not. The liability insurance requirements would be put onto the tenancy if that was a requirement. We would look into that to, to determine whether uh, our insurance uh, would encompass it. But being an entity of the size of ours, we have blanket insurance and and we've looked into this and, and we're not concerned about that okay uh just uh, one more question just leaving aside sort of the maybe the ethical nature of the business do you some of, a lot of the concerns were uh, or some of the concerns were about um public safety and things like that how how do you respond to that i suppose as as it could reflect negatively obviously on fairview mall specifically oh of course you know we 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 definitely um, are very con or would be very concerned about that i have visited the operation as have many uh, senior people in in our organization uh, we've spent a lot of time 
discussing with reptilia their history how they how they handle that sort of thing um my understanding is that they have never had uh any you know any animal escape or or any bite or, or something like that occurring uh to date which is a pretty good track record from our perspective i certainly don't uh, advocate um as a professional to understand um if if there should be more concerns but we had satisfied ourselves that uh, they're a fantastic operator okay thank you councillor lindell through you mr mayor to the presenter um have you had any indication from reptilia if they are not granted this exemption if they'll still continue to open a business in the fairview mall uh no i have not our intention um was to seek a bylaw exemption so that they can operate they have not um, done any construction in the space i would have uh, no indication that their intention would be to move forward as we've been going to you know putting together this submission to come to council uh, to seek the exemption before proceeding all right any other questions or comments Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Litteman, for the presentation. I'll now call upon Dr. Ann Elizabeth Nash to present. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and councillors. Um, as an independent scientist and animal welfare advocate, I very much appreciate the time to speak tonight. I'm Dr. Ann Elizabeth Nash, and I reside in Colorado in the United States. I received my doctoral degree from the, United, from the University of Northern Colorado, concentrating on the natural behavior of lizards, for which I was awarded the Dean's Citation for Excellence. Since 2013, I have conducted research on the spiny-tailed iguana in Costa Rica. I was an invited symposium speaker at the 2020 World Congress of Herpetology in New Zealand, and I have published in peer-reviewed journals on herpetology, animal behavior, and animal welfare. I hold a commission in the International Union for the Conservation of Nature as a member of the Iguana Specialist Group, and I have experience working in a venomous snake laboratory with species from around the world. And pertinent to your considerations, I am currently the executive director of Colorado Reptile Humane Society, which I founded 22 years ago. And in Colorado, we provide sheltering, adoption, and training of animal control officers and other professionals. And we are also licensed to rehabilitate native Colorado reptiles and amphibians. And uh, going on with a, a previous speaker, I want to remind everyone that captive bred reptiles are not genetically different from their wild counterparts. Captive bred reptiles are not bred for tolerance for human interactions or for life in captivity. Genetically, they are the same as their wild living reptiles. So Colorado Reptile Humane Society is boots on the ground in our state. We are the only humane society focused on reptiles. And at the shelter, we see the outcomes from the promotion of reptile ownership through reptile entertainment events, an increase in the desire to own something that seems really cool without any idea of the reality of that responsibility. And this increased desire leads to inappropriate purchases by the public. And I mean by inappropriate folks buying animals that they cannot provide enough space for, animals that have very, very long lives and outlive the interest of the people that purchase them. And this leads to their ultimate surrender to an animal shelter. And that's the good news. Animal shelters spend a great deal of energy and financial resources providing for reptiles who have very specific housing and dietary needs, even though most shelters were designed for cats and dogs and, and perhaps small birds. Shelters are then trying to find private homes for reptiles so that they have some security and predictability, but it's not always possible depending on the species and local resources. And the bad news is that with this increased reptile interest and ownership and limited capacities in local shelters, individuals are gonna to turn to some 
ability way to get rid of that pet they no longer want. They're gonna release a reptile into a local park or pond, which either means that pet reptile uh, will die in a horrible manner, or it will manage to survive and create problems for native wildlife. Red-eared slider turtles from the pet trade are already an invasive species across Ontario competing with your native turtles. And this, this desire happens because somebody saw a reptile at an event or at a, a roadside zoo. And these, these places highlight the cool factor. And, and let's face it, reptiles really are fascinating. But those same organizations and events didn't highlight the realities of reptile ownership. The great cost, the huge amount of space that's needed this long lifespan against often the short attention span of owners. And besides emphasizing these cool factors, reptile entertainment shows gives the impression to people that reptiles themselves don't mind these events. Reptiles are pulled out of these transport boxes and bags and into light and amplified sound with noisy voices and handling. There's no natural behavior observed because reptiles are held in the air, which would they'd only experience if a predator was trying to, to run off with them. And then they're subject to petting and groping by humans. And then they're subject to transporting back in some kind of box to a temporary cage. And that individual is robbed of a predictable, uh, predictable daily rhythm, and longer term rhythm. And they often miss their own optimum feeding and basking regimes because they have no choice in the matter. Dr. Nash, if I could ask you just to, to sum up. Yes. So these shows are, not, are delivering some facts, but really as a previous speaker outlined for us, not much education and certainly nothing is retained by the public because of the entertainment in it. They're not, these shows and this kind of facility is not in the best interest of the health and uh, welfare of animals, and it's not in the best interest of your shelters who will have to deal with downstream decisions by the public. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Nash. Are there any questions? Councillor Miller. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Nash. Just uh, one thing I was curious about that you mentioned about the genetics of these animals versus sort of the wild counterparts and how they're not different. And I realize this is pretty naive and, and probably a stupid question, but how does that differ from sort of the domestication of uh, pets like dogs and cats, like you mentioned? So we have for more than 10,000 years interbred dogs often for behaviors that we desired. And this has changed their head shape and their body shape and their behavior toward us. And we have in essence built an animal who truly loves humans and can also perform some particular activities. With reptiles, they are often being bred for the pet trade to become dwarf animals or to have changes in their colors or their changes in their patterns. And so that is changing what we might call the phenotype, the physical look of that animal, but it's not changing their behavior in ways that they would become more tolerant of being near us and certainly not like a dog of really desiring and needing to be near us. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that distinction. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, thank you, Dr. Nash. I'll now call upon Rob Laidlaw to present. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of Council. My name is Rob Laidlaw. I'm Executive Director of the Wildlife Protection Organization, ZooCheck. Um, my bio sketch was in previously submitted correspondence, so I won't bother talking about myself. <laughs> um, I wanted to make one point before I started into the three points that I was going to make tonight, and that is that uh, this is an issue where the animal welfare sector is all on board with opposition to reptilia. We have very long-standing established organizations. We have new organizations. We have them coming from all different perspectives. And we have ubiquitous uh, support uh, for the position that this exemption should not be given. And that's very unusual. That's very unusual. And I think it's worth noting. 
Uh, I want to bring uh, just three points to your attention. Uh, actually, it's two points because one was addressed by Brian York in his memo to the mayor and members of council about NX9, which was the CASA accreditation claim. Uh, he pulled NX9, so uh, and I think it's abundantly clear that uh, Repelia is not accredited by CASA or any other zoo association. But I have two other points that I want to make. One is with regard to... Uh, well, actually, both are with primarily regarding wildlife and captivity regulation and what the current situation means to the city of St. Catherine. So I want to talk about two things. One, the Provincial Animal Welfare Services Act limitations. Now, I've heard several times from Reptilia the claim that they are regulated through the Provincial Animal Welfare Services Act, which is just called the PAWS Act. That is not the case. The PAWS Act does not regulate zoos and there are extreme limitations in what it can do in a regulatory sense. Uh, certainly the PAWS inspectorate, uh, the inspectors that go out can examine specific issues, but ventures like Reptilia would remain essentially unregulated uh, if that's all that's looking at them, the PAWS inspectorate, and that will augment the risks for both people and animals alike. And that's because PAWS, the PAWS Act only addresses the treatment of captive exotic animals in a limited fashion through a set of very basic, mostly general, minimum standards of captive wildlife care, and they typically address issues in a retroactive fashion. Just to give you an idea of how basic the standards are, uh, there are 20 provisions uh, for animal welfare in the act that apply to literally thousands and thousands of species of animals. So you can imagine that with a diversity of animals out there, they would have to be pretty general and many people in enforcement would say that they're largely unenforceable. But more importantly, the PAWS Act does not contain any type of licensing regime for zoos. And I should also point out that Ontario does not license zoos, animal menageries, or zoo type exhibits housing exotic wildlife at all. There have been 14 attempts going back to the early 1980s to establish zoo licensing in the province. I've been involved in all of them, but none have been successful. I think it's very important to understand the limitations of the PAWS Act, including what it doesn't do because dealing with many exotic animal issues is going to end up in, the, in your laps as, as counsel in St. Catherine. So what doesn't the Act do? Well, the PAWS Act does not control exotic animal possession, acquisition, breeding, sale, trade, use, including in displays, traveling uh, exhibits, entertainment, or for personal amusement. It doesn't protect the public from most of the physical dangers posed by these animals or zoonotic disease risks. It also doesn't address animal welfare issues that are outside the limited remit of their standards. It doesn't address facility design, security issues, educational messaging, conservation, environmental risks, promotion of the pet trade, municipal nuisance issues such as noise, odor, traffic, and local emergency situations, and I could go on. Dealing with all of the potential problems that I just listed that the PAWS Act doesn't deal with will very unfortunately fall into your laps and that can result in a massive waste of municipal time, energy and resources, often for months, years or decades. One only has to look at Mark Drysdale and Lambton Shores or the Hastings Highlands or Spruce Haven Zoo in Sault Ste. Marie or even Dragon Farms, the uh, terribly uh, notorious venomous snake facility that used to exist in Port Colburn. So the PAWS Act uh, has its place, but it is not a regulatory regime for zoos. The second point I'd like to mention is the suggestion that the Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, that their permit to keep native wildlife in captivity uh, extends to exotic wildlife uh, in any way, shape or form. Uh, that's something that has been suggested by Reptilia. And I wanted to read you just a couple of quotes. This, this first one, uh, is from Tamara Gomer, the wildlife policy analysis analyst with the Fish and Wildlife Policy Branch of the Ontario Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Mr. Natural Resources. Mr. Leva, yes. I am gonna ask you to, to, to wrap up as you are past the five minutes. Okay, um, well, there's lots of evidence that uh, this uh, claimed exemption from the provincial fish and wildlife permit uh, uh, applies to exotics, it doesn't. And in closing, I'll just say that uh, I think there's a lot of good, very good reasons for, for not uh, supporting 
an exemption for reptilia and I hope you choose to move in that direction. It would be best for animals and for humans and the city of St. Catharines. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions? Councilor Kushner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have some questions uh, expressed uh, when you express concerns about reptilia. Uh, first, yes. uh, you, made the you made the suggestion that they claimed that they are accredited and you and uh, our business development director indicated they are not accredited. Is that correct? No, what I said was that in the staff report, there was a statement that uh, indicated that uh, Reptilia was accredited by CASA when that was not true. Um, and that has been confirmed by Jim Fassett from CASA. And in fact, as part of the memo that came from Brian York to the Mayor members of Council, that uh, letter from Jim Fassett offered clarification as to uh, the lack of CASA accreditation for Reptilia. So it was referring to the staff report. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, on Reptilia's website, they indicate that they are a zoo only, and yet in their presentation to us, they indicate they're both a zoo and, and uh, they also have an educational component. Now yeah, I think, uh, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah, so there appears to be a discrepancy between what they have on their website and what they are claiming uh, to uh, their presentation to us. Yes, I think, uh, and, and I don't know the motivation for this, but I think uh, the reptilia uh, management has downplayed aspects of of their business. Very clearly, they have uh, sort of four foundational tenets to their business, one being the public visitation gallery, which is the zoo that you can pay an admission and go see the animals. They've got a significant part of their physical zoo footprint devoted to uh, reptile pet product sales, something that a previous speaker said you do not find in any other zoo in Canada. So they've got that component. They've got an on-site sort of entertainment events component. So space rentals, you can do meet and greets with animals and pay money to get certain animals. And they have a very uh, significant program of off-site activities as well. And those can be meet and greets, stage shows, children's parties, uh, and I could go on and on. So I, I think the idea that's been promoted to some extent uh, by the rep reptilia management uh, has really emphasized things that are sort of very minor uh, in their operation, but that might look better. I would say it's a business and the business model they may see as sound and maybe some other people do, but it is a business. It's not like the Toronto Zoo. It's not like the old Reptile Breeding Foundation. It's not like the Indian River Reptile Zoo. It's not like most other places. It's a very commercialized type of business. Okay, and at the end of your presentation, you talked about the Ministry of Natural Resources, that yes. the claim was made that the MNR extends to exotic wildlife. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Uh, what we heard in London uh, from Reptilia was that uh, a permit, it's called a license to protect, uh, a license uh, for the keeping of specially protected and game wildlife in a zoo. And what that license is, is it's permission to keep certain species of native wild animals uh, that are listed in the Ontario Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act, because they, they have schedules and they have to be in the schedules, and that are listed on the individual permits held by uh, the people or businesses or institutions that have those permits. Uh, and it stops there. There is no uh, uh, extension that allows uh, that permit to cover exotic animals. The Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act has nothing to do with exotic animals. Uh, it has nothing to do with the regulation of zoos. Uh, all that permit does is say, you in your zoo, or you as an individual rehabilitation specialist, or you in this kind of facility can keep these turtles or these groundhogs or these raptors in your facility. And it has no bearing, no relevance to, to anything else. And uh, it, it's been disproven in the city of London. They went through this and that was sort of tossed aside and uh, uh, inevitably it will be brought up again, but I think it's an erroneous claim and uh, 
It's just for anybody that checks, whether with the policy people at the MNR, we had several legal, legal opinions done, check with the uh, other authorities, and you'll find that it, it's, it's nonsense. Uh, that license doesn't apply to anything but the specific native animals listed on the permit. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Phillips. Not necessarily a question, but just a confirmation uh, to the presenter. In, the Jan in January of 22, St. Catharines received an email from CASA confirming reptilius accreditation. However, uh, mm -hmm. Director York did send us a memo on December the 9th, uh, yes. said since publishing of the November 28th council report, staff have been informed by CASA's that reptilia's accreditation status is no longer in good standing. So, in fact, Director York has made us aware of the fact that the accreditation was lifted. Yes, yes, I understand that. And I actually referred to that, that particular memo that you received earlier. So, and I, you know, I, I uh, appreciate Brian York doing that. So Excellent. That's great. All right. Any other questions? Seeing none. All right. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. I'll now call great, upon thank you. Jonathan Feltron to present. Good evening, um, Mayor Cisco and council members. <clears throat> My name is Jonathan Feltron and I am a Brock student uh, studying biology, about to finish up, this, I'm in my final year here. And um, when I heard about this uh, request for an exemption of the bylaw, I uh, wanted to delegate as I wanted to speak on the points that previous presenters had have put very eloquently. I, I have uh, not but to reiterate their points. So allow me to simply say that I, I'm against the exemption and I believe that the city of St. Catharines should not have to assume responsibility for regulating exotic wildlife solely due to a private business's desire to open a location in the city and that the city likely lacks the resources and internal expertise to do so. Justifiably so because it's it's not written, in, written into any of the bylaws that, uh, you know, they don't, they don't previously permit such a thing. So there is no expectation that the city should be equipped to do this sort of thing. And I don't believe that the captivity of exotic wildlife, especially in a for-profit facility, is in the animal's best interest. And to reiterate the concerns previous presenters have raised, I, I implore council members to consider the possibility that presenting reptiles at events encourages children living in the community to keep exotic wildlife as pets. Um, and uh, I was going to uh, reference um, an article published in a uh, local news outlet about previous um, uh, requests for this exemption that were withdrawn uh, before the point of actual debate. Uh, but given the uh, expansive nature of previous interest points, I think it's unnecessary. I, I would just like to say that I agree with with uh, what all sides of uh, the opposition to this to this uh, to the approval of this request uh, have have said, and uh, that is all. Thank you, Mr. Feltron. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you for the presentation. I'll now call upon Adrian George to present. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Thank you for allowing me to speak and offer a few words this evening. Uh, most of my points have been covered, so I'll keep this brief. Uh, as a resident of the Niagara region, I strongly oppose the amendment of bylaw 95212 that would allow Reptilia to set up operations within our community, or any community for that matter. Housing dangerous and exotic animals, as well as transporting them through the city for display at private events, and bookings is not in the best interest of our region nor those of the animals being confined. Our bylaws were constructed for the purpose of public safety and I question why we would consider changing these safety measures for the economic gain of a private and entertainment based business with such high risks. St. Catherine City Council made a progressive step forward in 2019 when it was decided to no longer allow animal circuses to operate within the city. Previous City Councillor Carrie Porter stated 
For the entertainment of humans, these animals face many instances of cruelty and they live lives of diminished quality. Ms. Porter told Council that St. Catharines is a compassionate city and compassion should extend to both humans and animals. I can only hope that such compassion and reason will be applied to this application as well. Uh, businesses of this type have applied for and been denied the ability to set up similar facilities across the country. As mentioned by another speaker, Reptilia's application to amend similar bylaws in Toronto was reviewed and, uh, and denied in 2021. When another similar business venture was pitched in Manitoba, the CEO of the Winnipeg Humane Society said, the air conditioning of a mall can be very punishing to these exotic animals and extremely stressful to their internal organs. It's, recognized, it's a recognized standard of amphibian care that there be not only a proper diet and plenty of space, but that travel be limited. Also, it can be difficult or impossible to recognize stress, fear, or illness in a reptile or amphibian. And the Winni Winnipeg Humane Society went on to publish a statement to include, exotic animal displays also pose a severe public safety risk as they force non-domesticated species to interact with the public, especially children, in an unnatural foreign environment, which can result in bites, scratches, and other serious injuries. Disease risk is also a critical issue. Many exotic animal displays market themselves as being educational, and the Winnipeg Humane Society continued to say that there's very little evidence to support that these displays provide substantial educational value of any kind. In fact, these displays often can undermine true exotic animal welfare and uh, conservation efforts. The handling and parading of exotics in unconventional settings only promotes the ownership of extremely misunderstood and complex animals. So to close again, I ask that City, uh, St. Catherine City Council please deny this requested amendment to the bylaw. And like many other Canadian cities, not allow reptilia to bring their unregulated, potentially hazardous and inhumane entertainment business to the region. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. George. Are there any questions for the presenter? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. And I will now call upon Andrea Baker to present. Hi, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Thank you for hearing my delegation today, a second year sociology student at Brock University. And I'm asking you to deny the request to for an exemption to the animal control bylaw. Um, a couple of things I'll just breeze through because they've been mentioned already. I'm not comfortable with wild venomous animals housed in public spaces. The inherent risk of animal escape and potential injury and death would haunt all residents here, I believe. Um, Trading, housing, and handling of wild animals is a hazard for introducing new diseases into human populations. If we are serious about public health and preventing new pandemics, we have to treat it at the source. None of us wants a new pandemic. I'm sure we all know this. Uh, many people in St. Catharines rely on Fairview Mall for basic necessities such as food, clothing, or jobs. Uh, I would not feel comfortable in the area around where dangerous reptiles are housed, and I have heard the same sentiment from my friends at Brock as well. This would cause economic dam damage as well to the legitimate and necessary businesses in and around Fairview Mall. Um, also, zoos are falling out of favor due to animal welfare concerns. This is no different. Everyone I know from St. Catharines hates marine land, essentially. Reptilia says they rescue the majority of the animals they house, but they're not a sanctuary. They are a zoo. Profit is their main concern, and animal welfare, uh, community safety will always be second to that priority. From the perspective of a reptile, reptilia will be a place of suffering and confusion. They cannot advocate for themselves on a political level, so I am here doing that on their behalf. Please acknowledge their needs and interests. If allowed, reptilia will become a moral embarrassment for St. Catharines and a stain on their reputation for decades. We don't want a tig tiger king and we do not want a reptilia. If we want to be thought of as a progressive city, we must not buy into archaic practices. Thirdly, bylaws are put in place for a reason. The city has already made this decision that certain dangerous animals should not be housed in St. Catharines. 
reptilia should not be held above this law or any other laws that are already established. When reptilia sought an exemption from the animal control bylaw in Toronto, uh, there was an investigation in Toronto denied reptilia this exemption. To my knowledge, St. Catharines has not completed their investigation and is relying on reptilia to assure that everything is safe, humane and under control. I would like to remind you, Mr. Mayor and city councillors, uh, that uh, reptilia as a business must prioritize their profits and that it is your job as representatives of the residents of St. Catharines, like myself and other delegates, to make sound and safe decisions on our behalf, not on behalf of businesses. Um, and just quickly uh, addressing previous speaking points, uh, I think there's so many different venues of entertainment. I just thought of a couple just now, trampoline park, museum, indoor playground, music venue, movie theater, some sort of rec center, like an indoor sports field. There are many, many options. And I say it is much better to wait for a legitimate, safe business than to settle for a disastrous business that will be with us for many decades. Uh, we can do better than a roadside zoo. Again, please do not pay attention. Please do not give the same legitimacy to people who are looking for profits. Please uh, prioritize your constituents who live in St. Catharines. We can have fun without victimizing animals and without putting anim uh, citizens at risk. Again, thank you so much for your attention. I'm asking you to deny reptilia uh, exemption to the animal control bylaw and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Are there any questions for the presenter? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. I'll now call upon the applicant, Brian Child, Michael Lerner, and Dr. Robert Murphy on behalf of Reptilia to present. I seem to have lost the video. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, uh, my name is Michael Lerner. Uh, I, I'm a lawyer uh, uh, in London, Ontario, and I'm here to uh, to speak on Reptilia's behalf. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to make certain that council members understand that the applicant is not asking for an amendment to the bylaw, but is asking for an exemption. Uh, the question then uh, is, is an exemption necessary? Uh, the bylaw uh, has a number of restrictions or conditions, but it also has a saving provision in the paragraph uh, six bracket each, uh, which refers to the supply of animals to uh, elementary and secondary school and, and uh, other uh, uh, post-secondary institutions. Uh, this uh, falls right into the uh, question asked by Councillor Miller. Uh, Reptilia has over the years supplied 7, 000, over 7,000 schools and 20,000 animals uh, to uh, those schools, uh, two of which are the Toronto District and the Toronto D Catholic District School Boards. And you have been provided with videos from representatives from those two uh, 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 boards of education uh, that uh, endorse and uh, 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 with regard to the association and relationship with relationship with those schools. Uh, so the educational component uh, is, is significant. It was what the Reptilia started in the first place and it continues to expand and will expand uh, uh, in uh, the St. Catharines region uh, if permitted to uh, operate. Uh, I also uh, direct you to the issue of uh, letters of support that have been received uh, from both uh, Whitby and Vaughn that strongly endorse uh, the operation of uh, Reptilia and what it has, it has contributed to uh, those communities. Uh, it's not unusual for uh, lawyers to have different opinions. Uh, I have had a, a very fruitful and uh, wholesome discussion with uh, the acting city solicitor. Uh, our difference uh, relates around the word supply in paragraph 6H. 
I, do, I believe that it is his position that the uh, there's not evidence that reptilia does supply animals uh, to the institutions as indicated. Uh, I submit to you that uh, the evidence is that 7,000 schools and 20,000 animals over the period of time is sufficient uh, to satisfy that condition uh, where supply is not defined in any way, shape or form while others are uh, clearly within the bylaw. Uh, those, that's uh, all I wish to say. I, I will defer to Mr. Child. Hi, the Honour Mayor and Councillors, Brian Child here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, sir. My compliments to your ECDEV department. They've been wonderful to work with and shown us a number of sites, which we picked First Capital's Fairview uh, Centre, which is the IKEA store, which is independent of the shopping centre. Thus, some of the concerns were expressed earlier would not be applicable. Um, <laughs> we ran a small survey just to see what kind of demand there might be. And we got 754 supporters and zero against us. Um, as with Whitby and Vaughn, Whitby, we've been there for about five years. Vaughn, we've been there for 27. Um, we have no venomous bites. We have no escapes. We have none of the things that uh, so many fear-mongering people have, have uh, put before you, and, and we can prove it. And the letters that are from Whitby and Vaughn attempt to do that. Uh, we have uh, support from the Ministry of Tourism, and uh, we probably can go ahead and operate under the exemption that you already have. But we really don't want to do that. We want your own uh, we want your exemption so that you're with us and we can work with you as we do with other cities. Uh, mainly the animal questions were the most uh, prolific tonight. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Murphy uh, and he can speak to uh, the concerns that you may have there. Bob? Yes, I'm here, Brian. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you, Mayor Cisco and uh, Council for giving me this time. Um, I'm a professor at uh, University of Toronto, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, Director of Animal Welfare and Conservation at Reptilia, and um, curator, Senior Curator Emeritus at the ROM in charge of amphibians and reptiles, where I worked for almost 39 years. I got my PhD from UCLA, and I'm elected to the Executive Council of the World Congress of Herpetology. The first thing to note that's really important, and it's counter to not most of the negative comments we heard, and that is reptilia does not purchase or condone the removal of wild animals for pets, period. We don't do it. We do bring in animals, rescue them, or surrendered animals are confiscated from drug raids from police and use them for exhibit as opposed to euthanizing them which is the alternative. We use them in education. Uh, the animals in general are multi-generational animals that have been reared and they are very well accumulated to uh, people um, and um, are well on their way actually to genetically um, and to uh, uh, becoming, uh, 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 where's the word? Um, uh, domesticated. So animal welfare is covered by PAWS. Um, we know this happens and it's a very strict coverage of PAWS because a recent raid on a horse farm in St. Thomas in which all the horses were taken, the owners were banned from ever having horses again and they received a fine of over $100,000. So PAWS is a very serious regulatory um, agency that comes through and we're working with them proactively. One thing that nobody really considers is that zoos are necessary because of the anthrop Anthropocene species extinction crisis. I mean, climate change is changing habitats, which is driving animals to extinction. Human incursions into the wild are also 
crushing animals and killing them. Amphibians and reptiles are already estimated to have a 10% loss of biodiversity. The only place for survival for these animals will be zoos and sanctuaries, and this is especially true for dangerous animals. And thus, the anti-zoo activists are really, by definition, pro-extinction. There's just no other option for these animals. Now, science must be unbiased and open for reassessment. And most of the letters and most of the facts that have been submitted to you in advance are based on misinformation. The letters claim that there are 70 to 74,000 cases of salmonellosis in the, the U.S. per year. But the last five years, the CDC has an average reporting of 47.4 cases. That's less than 100. That translates to an estimated 1,375 cases. CDC estimates that there are 1.35 million cases of salmonellosis in the year annually, and thus reptiles account for one in 1,000 of these cases, not 6% or 26%. If you adjust this for households, then 0.01 is the magic number, where the overall rate is 0.4. Thus, people with reptiles are 40 times safer than the general public in terms of acquiring salmonellosis. And by the way, poultry is 12 times greater. Somebody made a case about a zoonotic disease um, that occurred in a zoo. If you look at the data, the zoo has a million visitors per year. There's been one case in 27 million people visiting the years because visiting the zoo, because it's 27 years, and that's 15 people of a million but there's more than 300 zoos with animals and no reported cases. And so the chance of getting this disease um, is, you have a standard better chance of getting the disease um, uh, in the general public and from the food than you eat than going to a zoo. Zoos are extremely safe. There have been questions raised about reptilia. We have strict protocols in place. And in fact, Toronto said our protocols are adequate all dangerous animals are double locked. No one person has the same key in the tops of the hallways, which only particular staff have access to, um, are covered in a fine wire mesh to further prevent animals from escaping. No animal has ever escaped. Now it's true that Reptilia lost its acad CASA accreditation. The primary concern was a shift space for a crocodile in the Vaughn facility. The same requirement was not applied to the Vaughn facility. The same requirement was not applied to any other zoo. So CASA has been extremely um, inconsistent in applying these things. But CASA has no, doesn't license. They have no authority to um, pursue anything um, in terms of any offense with it. Sir, and if I if Mr. I can ask you to, if I can ask you to sum up at this point, I would be more than happy to. Right now, I could talk about household data and that reptilia is not encouraging people demonstrably to keep pets. But I will end there and let to uh, ask me questions should you have any. Excellent. Thank you very much. We've had a couple of presentations there uh, from the proponents. Uh, are there any questions from council, Councillor Miller? Uh, thank you. Uh, through the mayor, isn't this idea uh, of rescuing uh, these animals, isn't that just sort of a good business model for Reptilia who, who gets these animals for free from places that are hoarding them or from people who no longer need them? Isn't that sort of the primary motivator of Reptilia in taking in some of these animals? I can answer that question for you, Councillor, uh, through the mayor. Uh, reptilia is constantly called by uh, first responders who are confronted with uh, uh, animals, particularly reptiles. Uh, recently, an alligator was literally thrown out of uh, a vehicle on the uh, 401. Uh, the people who were called uh, to uh, recover that animal uh, was reptilia. They have been called in other uh, instances uh, I believe it's in Vaughan where there, uh, a snake, a dangerous snake was found in a backyard. First responders were unable to deal with it, called in reptilia. 
uh, recently a facility in Whitby uh, was forced to close down and uh, uh, we were contacted uh, by PAWS who asked us to take the animals in, otherwise they would have been euthanized. Uh, so uh, while it is uh, certainly a good uh, uh, public relations, uh, it serves a, a very useful purpose in the community where people uh, uh, buy these animals and uh, they outgrow their facilities and they simply abandon them and they uh, present a risk not only uh, to the community uh, but a risk to themselves. Uh, so and in addition to that, uh, Reptilia is involved in the training of first responders, the Department of National Defense uh, in, the, uh, in the care and uh, uh, handling of these animals. So there is a an educational component at the school level, but there's also a significant educational component at the uh, the level of uh, first responders, police, paramedics, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and and other than rescues or um, I don't know, maybe bequeathments or or things like that, does Reptilia actively trade in in these animals? Like, would they seek out an animal to to buy and and put in display? I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by uh, a seek out. Uh, Dr. Murphy, maybe you can handle that question better than I can. Uh, I, I can answer that question for you. Uh, Reptilia um, not only takes in these uh, abandoned animals, but we rehome them to institutions. Um, for example, we've had uh, some very dangerous venomous animals uh, that have been turned into us, and those were checked for health, packed up, and shipped down to Venom Institutes in the United States to keep them out of public hands with that. Reptilia uh, does on occasion purchase animals. Uh, we purchased animals recently at Nile crocodiles. The Nile crocodiles came in um, as a breeding pair, a matched breeding pair, although we will not breed them. Um, so they are uh, together. They were purchased uh, from a farm that's accredited in South Africa as a breeding facility. And so in fact, CITES uh, permits were very easy uh, to acquire for export and import into Canada. So we do not buy and have never bought wild caught animals. We, we don't condone it. Okay, thank you for that. And, and I guess maybe last question. The, I'm, I'm interested in what Professor Murray, uh, Murphy said about um, extinction, but other people have levied that places like Reptilia actually fuel uh, the bread for captivity industry by having sort of an outlet and a buyer, maybe, or at least uh, uh, somewhere to place these animals. And then perhaps if, if places like Reptilia didn't exist, there wouldn't be that need, uh, that market in the bread for captivity industry. I, I mean, how would you respond to that? Well, actually, you know, that's a, a common um, distraction that's tossed at us. And so I got online and I looked up the relative numbers for that. Uh, the U.S. between 2007 and 2020 saw an increase from about 2% of households to 4.5% of households with reptile companions and support animals. In Canada, between the same time period, there was an 8% growth in terms of number of animals, data from Statistica, but at the same time, there was a 16% population growth. And so the actual ownership in Canada has decreased on a per capita basis. And to say that Reptilia is encouraging pet keepers when the U.S. grow, it's a, it's a great stretch of the imagination to say that reptilia impacted the growth in the United States. So we think part of it may be that when people come in to reptilia who are interested in a pet, we give them some very serious advice on terms of what makes a good pet, what does not make a good companion animal. A friend of mine wanted a tortoise, so I took her into reptilia and showed how sulcata tortoises will climb through walls and ask her if her grandchildren wanted them. She was 16 years old. I said, well, the animal's gonna live long enough that your grandchild is gonna have to take care of it. 
And so she bought a stuffed snowy toy snake and she was very happy with it. That satisfied her reptile need with that. So as people come in, there's a, a great opportunity to uh, teach them. Physicians that I consulted um, said that the reason that people with reptile companions and support animals have a lower infection rate of salmonellosis is because of education. And CDC points out that education is the key to controlling salmonellosis. And so by selling supplies to people who own these animals, we can educate them and deal with them. Okay, and so just to sum, you do not believe that- Council uh, Miller, I'm gonna pause for a second. I'm going to pause for a second. We're running up against curfew at this time. So before we continue, I need a two thirds majority to extend for 30 minutes. So can I have a motion to extend the curfew? Councilor Miller, Councilor Kushner, all those in favor? Opposed? Just the one, sorry, Councilor Harris. All right, so we're extended to 1030. We are now up against the half an hour curfew, so. Okay, I will wrap. So just to sum, you don't believe that reptilia or places like roadside zoo attractions or like this contribute to breeding for captivity? Well, I, I can say that I believe reptilia uh, does not in, that encourages responsible ownership and I don't think it encourages captive propagation. Okay. The evidence, the evidence is contrary to that when you have a decrease per capita for the number of reptiles and, and homes in Canada. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the city solicitor would like to add. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to the councillors, uh, I would like to make a couple of comments with respect to, firstly, one comment that was made by Dr. Murphy, which was that animal welfare is covered by the Ontario, Ontario Provincial Animal Welfare Services Act, which is uh, PAUSE uh, for short. And I took some notes and, and uh, I believe Dr. Murphy said that this is a very serious um, uh, legislation and PAUSE are a, re a very serious regulatory agency and, and they have very strict protocols. Uh, on that note, the protection of animals is, is, a, is a very main concern. Uh, I would just like to point out, based on those comments, that uh, section 67 of um, that legislation specifically says that if there's a com uh, conflict between um, uh, municipal bylaws and this legislation, in the event of a conflict between a provision of this act or of a regulation made under this act and of a municipal bylaw pertain pertaining to the welfare of uh, or the prevention of cruelty to animals, the provisions that afford the greater protection to the animal shall prevail. And on that note, uh, uh, the city's current bylaw as it is, is written uh, in my uh, submission provides that protection. Uh, uh, another comment that I would like to um, make with respect to Mr. Lerner's comment uh, I can confirm that it is the, 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 the city's legal department's position uh, that the, the city's bylaw uh, should be read in a, in a strict interpretation as opposed to the liberal interpretation as Mr. Uh, Lerner put it. Thank you. Thank you, city solicitor. Are there any other questions or comments for the presenter? All right, seeing none. Uh, we have a motion the council close the public meeting respecting the application for exemption to bylaw 95-212 reptilia. Can I have a motion to close the public meeting? Councillor Phillips, seconded by Councillor Lindell. All those in favor? Opposed? The public meeting is closed. Can I have, I believe it was Councillor Harris had offered to move the recommendation in the report. I do need a seconder for that to put it on the floor. As a reminder, moving or seconding does not indicate which Thank you, Councillor Stevens. If there are questions, further questions of staff at this time, feel free to ask. However, I believe a lot of questions have been asked. Seeing none, 
staff recommendation is on the floor. The council approve an amendment to bylaw 95-212 attached as appendix two to authorize Reptilia Inc. to operate at 285 Geneva Street known as the Fairview Mall and to offer offsite educational project training or authorize special event activities within city limits, including transportation to and from such offsite locations and that the city solicitor be directed to prepare the necessary bylaws and that the clerk be directed to make all necessary notifications and I will look to the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Harris. No. No. Councillor Dodge. No. Councillor Garcia. No. Councillor Kushner. No. Councillor Miller. No. Councillor Phillips. No. Councillor Townsend. No. Councillor Williamson. No. Councillor McPherson. No. Councillor Lindell. No. Councillor Ratzlaff? No. Councillor Stevens? No. Mayor Sisko? No. And that's lost. All right, moving on to item 10, the Green Municipal Fund motion and net zero retrofit. Uh, moving the motion, I have Councillor Townsend. I'll second it if you want. And Councillor Harris is seconding the motion. So the motion is on the screen. Councillor Townsend, uh, you obviously can speak to it. Um, if you are going to uh, read it, I would ask that we stick to the be it resolved clauses <laughs> just because you. we are up against the curfew. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Cisco. Uh, through you, um, it's been on the agenda for, for a little while. I've spoken um, about the Green Municipal Fund at Council uh, previous, um, asking essentially for staff to, to um, familiarize themselves with the FCM document taking your indoor ice rink to net zero, asking that we consider looking at our four phase approach to what it might look like to move to a net zero retrofit for indoor arenas, uh, work with um, infrastructure and inclusive community buildings program, the retrofit fund, and uh, find suitable funding opportunities. Also be a further resolve that uh, staff submit proposals to FCM to fund um, an appropriate feasible study, ideally coinciding with the conservation and demand um, green, it, to help uh, cut out greenhouse gas uh, emissions. But uh, it's been on the agenda and I hope council has had a chance to, uh, to review this. All right, thank you, Council Townsend. Uh, Council Phillips. Quickly through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to uh, our CAO, uh, which staff department or staff member will be responsible for looking after this? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, it'll be a combination um, of various departments, but primarily through uh, EFES in, in the facilities, but also in coordination with, we have a grant team that, that meets um, quite regularly on all of these programs, so it will be incorporated in that team. And we'll be moving on this immediately? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, we, we will. We've already started investigating the opportunities. Thank you. Excellent. Any other further comments or questions? I'll right. just quickly, uh, just, I also just want to thank staff for their work on this and uh, uh, reaching out and finding solutions to, uh, to find an approach to this. Excellent. And I will just say thank you, Councillor Townsend, for putting this on the floor and getting it uh, going at an important time in the budget cycle, but also as we ramp up our efforts for the next year and uh, moving towards net zero. So thank you for that. And thank you to staff for beginning the work on this. I'll look to the clerk to call the roll. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Ratzlaff? Yes. Councillor Stevens? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Cisco? Yes. That's carried. Item 10.2, holiday parking promotion. I'm moving the motion. I have Councillor McPherson. Do I have a seconder for the motion? Councillor Ratzlaff? Uh, again, Councillor McPherson, I'll just ask you to stick to the be it resolved clause. Happy to, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, therefore, be it resolved that bylaw 2020 156 be amended to delegate authority to the city treasurer to also allow for free parking, parking garages for specific periods of time, and special mm -hmm. holiday parking promotion programs as requested by any business improvement area board of management. All right, uh, questions, comments, Councilor Garcia? No, uh, Mr. Mayor, I had an amendment that 
this area. So and <clears throat> I'm hoping that it would be friendly. So Okay, just looking to the mover, seconder. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies, Councilor Rasloff. I should have said you have to say yes too. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Uh, so the uh, the amendment that's been put on and accepted is friendly simply to extend it to Port Dalhousie, uh, waiving the parking for the same time period as a downtown parking promotion. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, I will simply applaud the downtown BIA for their uh, their promotion again this year, and I encourage all residents in the community, when this if this passes, when this passes, to take advantage of the free parking both in the downtown and in the beautiful borough of Port Dalhousie. I'll look to the clerk to call the roll. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Ratzlaff? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Williamson? It might be a village. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Stevens? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. And Councillor Miller? Yes. And Mayor Cisco? Yes. And that's carried. All right. Call for notices of motion. Seeing none. Report requests. Are there any report requests this evening? Councillor Garcia? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I, I understand that the um, um, staff received a letter from the uh, St. Catharines Hotelier regarding their concern about the uh, municipal accommodations tax that is uh, uh, the council had agreed to uh, have it come into effect in january i think and um, i would just like um, uh, to ask staff for a report to uh, review that the content of that letter and uh, and come up with any suggestions recommendations as uh, that would flow from that Excellent. Okay, that's appreciated. Is there a seconder for that? Councilor Phillips, thank you. Uh, any other report requests? Mr. Mayor. Seeing none. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, committee and task force minutes that council receive and file the minutes of the advisory committees of council as presented. Uh, Councilor Kushner, seconded by Councilor Ratzlaff. All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Uh, under 13.2, the first Ontario Performing Arts Centre investment policy. This is moved by Councillor Garcia. Do we have a seconder for this motion? Councillor McPherson? Uh, Townsend. Oh, count, you know what, Councillor Townsend, because he was uh, was the full pack rep. Uh, Councillor Garcia? Yes, do you, you want me to read just therefore it be resolved? Therefore be resolved, yes please. Therefore be it resolved that further to the request from the first Ontario Performing Arts Centre Board of Directors, by law 2018-177 be amended to permit the implementation of the investment policy by the first Ontario Performing Arts Center in form and content satisfactory to the city solicitor and be further resolved that the city solicitor prepare the necessary bylaws. And I would just add to that that uh, I've been on the uh, finance and audit committee of the PAC board from the beginning and uh, uh, Councilor Townsend joined as well, and that uh, uh, the center is trying to generate some extra revenue and take advantage of the higher interest rates, uh, which helps us also. Excellent. Uh, seeing no hands up looking to talk about this, I'll look to the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Garcia? Yes. Councilor Townsend? Yes. Councilor Dodge? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Gratzlaff? Yes. Councillor Stevens? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Cisco? Yes. And that's carried. All right. Uh, moving on, we've got bylaws. We are so close to 2023. Uh, that the bylaws listed on the council agenda as A to M be read a first time considered and passed, save and accept bylaw G and I, and that they be signed and executed by the mayor and the clerk. Mover and a seconder. Har it. Harris is moving. Seconded by Councillor Kushner. All those in favor? Opposed? A team. That's carried. The A team. Wonderful. Uh, 16.2 uh, additional bylaws at the following additional bylaw, additional bylaw A be read the first time considered and passed. A bylaw to authorize the conveyance of certain lands to the locks incorporated. One reading with respect to sale of lands known as Hogan's Alley. Uh, and then bylaw B. 
a bylaw to amend bylaw number 2014-169 entitled a bylaw to appoint a chief building official and inspectors under the, under the Ontario Building Code Act 1992. Can I have a mover and a seconder for that? Councillor McPherson, Councillor Lindell, all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Motion to adjourn. Councillor McPherson, Councillor Kushner, all those in favor? Opposed? Happy holidays, folks.